Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the greatest Entitled Parent Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled Parents you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that if this video gets 1000 likes, she won't try to speak to anyone's manager for an entire week. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And become an official member of the ReArmy today, and I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming video. R slash Entitled Parents. Karen demands I buy her a $200,000 car. I'm 30 and my girlfriend is 25. She wrecked and totaled her car last week. No injuries, thankfully. She is a notoriously bad driver. She's been driving since she was 16, and this is the third time that she's totaled, found at fault for all three, and been involved with multiple other minor accidents. A couple of days ago, we left to take her to the dealership so that she can get another car, and directs me to drive her to the Porsche dealership as she's scheduled to test drive a brand new 2021 Porsche convertible. What? That's an obvious joke, right? She tells me she's dead serious. She just totaled an older model Kia Rio. Why the sudden upgrade to a $200,000 car? I don't even drive a car that nice. An argument ensued from there. I ask how she's planning on paying for that. She's a waitress at a very high-end restaurant with big clientele, so she's paid well. But business has been slow the last few months due to everything going on. She says, obviously, with my job, we'd be able to afford it no problem. While it's true that it wouldn't break the bank, I told her that I might as well light the money on fire with the way she drives. I suggested she get a used non-luxury brand and that if she can go a few years without an accident, maybe then get a luxury car. A little more back and forth and neither of us feel like getting a car anymore, so we go back home. It's now been three days since the argument and she's been sleeping in the spare bedroom and barely talking to me. The friends we have in our group chat are split and some believe I'm the jerk and some believe she is. So Reddit, what's your verdict? Well, what do you think? Should he go ahead and buy her the car or not? Please let us know. Of course he should, unless he doesn't love her. Karen doesn't believe I'm brain damaged and partially blind. This happened a while ago in the good old days before the world turned to poop. I'm a 29 year old incomplete quadriplegic with a severe acquired brain injury. My spinal cord injury is obvious as I'm in a wheelchair, but my brain injury isn't obvious to most people as I can communicate normally in most situations. I have damage to the temporal lobe and the optic nerve in my brain which has affected my sight and the damage to the temporal lobe affects general thought processes but I can easily manage doing day to day tasks. The outside half of my right eye is blind and I have double vision from my lazy eye which gets worse when I'm stressed. But when I'm stressed or have too much audio and physical stimulation my brain switches off making it hard for me to communicate and harder for me to see. This doesn't happen very often but when I'm stressed or I have a bad migraine, which I get often. My vision gets extremely blurred and I find it hard to see anything in front of me. Now on with the story. One day when I was out shopping, I came across a Karen in the wild. I heard someone far behind me muttering something I couldn't make out, which was followed by an excuse me. There was enough room beside me for a trolley to get past me and she sounded far enough away that I didn't think she was talking to me, so I continued what I was doing. A minute later, I heard her say again, Excuse me! But this time louder and closer. So I turned to ask her if she needed anything. Karen, About time. I've been trying to get your attention for the past five minutes. Me, You were trying to get my attention from the back of my head? Last time I checked, my eyes aren't there. I use sarcasm as a way to calm myself, but saying that to a Karen wasn't the best idea. Karen, Don't you get smart with me. I was waving my hand to your side and you were ignoring me. Me. Oh, I'm half blind in one eye. If you were waving at me on that side, I couldn't see you. You're not blind. What are you on about? I wanted to get past you, but you were ignoring me. Me. There's enough room for you to get past. Is there something wrong with your legs? I said the last part slightly patronizingly. Karen. How dare you speak to me like that? Now get out of my way. Her tone and her aggressive sounding voice caught me off guard and I knew I needed to get away from her before my brain did its annoying switch off thing. Me, timely. Ma'am? Karen. Seriously, what's your issue? Are you all that stupid? Me. 
I have a brain injury. And like heck you do. Now get out of my way. And then it happened. My eyesight started to blur and I could hear a slight ringing in my head. I couldn't speak and I was trying to move my wheelchair, but my hands were shaking. Karen had gotten some attention from other customers and a staff member. Someone came up beside me and put their hand on my shoulder, which made me flinch and asked me if I was all right, but I couldn't get any words out. Karen, she wouldn't get out of my way. And then she got weird. Staff, there's enough room for you to get past. Now leave before I call security. Karen, yeah, whatever lady, have fun with the cripple. As she left the store, the staff member managed to calm me down enough for me to get out. I brain damage, which she seemed to understand. She stayed with me until I was able to get the words out and explain what happened and why I couldn't get the words out. Staff, that's not a problem. My name is Sharon. If you ever see that woman again, you find a staff member and we'll handle it, okay? What she said was not right. I thanked her and left the store to go home. I was a little too riled up to continue my shopping. After this happened, I learned a few ways to de-escalate the situation by pretending I don't speak English and saying something random in a different language or coming straight out with a, how about you go forget yourself instead and the nicest and happiest voice I can get out. That one usually stops people and sometimes gets a laugh out of them. The moral of this story, don't be a Karen, I guess. Entitled mom drops her spawn off at a daycare he's not even registered at. Backstory. From about 2018 to 2019, I worked at an after-school program with a church that also functioned as a private school. I worked mostly with the after-school kids, ranging in ages from 5 to 12. I mostly worked with the older kids, who were about 10 to 14. This school also had a daycare slash nursery. I hardly interacted with the daycare, but sometimes I would have to sub for a teacher who was running late or couldn't come in. This story was one of those rare times I had to sub for a teacher in the daycare and just a combination of everything going wrong. I also guess this would be an r slash I don't work here lady story too. When working at the after school program, it was a part time gig since I was only there from about 1 in the afternoon until the last closing time which was 6. It was nice since I could sleep in and do my schoolwork. It was a great setup and 90% of the kids and parents were great. Hardly any of them were entitled and not gonna lie, I miss my kids a lot. But very rarely I would get called into work to sub for a teacher in the daycare. Now quick note here is that the daycare was run by the church. The after school program was run by the school. They were separate entities, but sometimes the daycare would call teachers from the after school to sub for the daycare sometimes. It was never a problem since the daycare workers were really nice, showed us how to handle toddlers and babies. Anyway, I said yeah, I would watch this class of four year olds while their teacher was at a doctor's appointment. No biggie, it shouldn't be more than an hour. Like at most daycares and my after school program, you have to register your kid if you want them to attend daycare or the after school program and that way their name can be added to the role. Also, every time you come to pick up or drop off your kid, you have to sign them in and out. The same applies to visitors. So I go in, sign in the sub list, go to the classroom and do a quick roll call. I have a total of 8 kids, cool beans. 2 hours go by, their teacher is still a no show and I'm doing my best teaching their bible lesson. 9.30, the kids are in their stations playing taking a break from their reading lesson. The door opens and the devil and her spawn come in. Like I said earlier, I have no clue who these kids are, but I do have my role. The devil, Karen, walks in, ushers in spawn. Karen comes in after her son before I even had a chance to speak to him and ask his name. Karen turns to me and says, Are you the teacher? Me. Uh, no, I'm Miss Mary. I'm just subbing for Miss Lily, the regular teacher. Fine. When is she going to be back? Me. Hopefully in a little while. I don't normally work here. I work in the after school program. I was wondering, is your son new? I don't see his name on the roll. Karen. Oh yes, we registered yesterday. Me. A little wary. Oh, okay. I'm sure he'll get added to the roll in the coming week. Karen. Okay, we'll be back around 8 to pick him up. I stop as she leaves for the door. Me. Ma'am, you can't leave your son here after 6. It's a state law. 80% sure this is true. Karen. Okay, fine. And Karen drew out fine like I just asked her to take out the garbage. As she walks out the door, Spawn is playing with the kids and getting along just fine. But part of me was just wary, like something didn't settle right with me. I grabbed the walkie-talkie and radioed the supervisor, asking if Miss Lily's class was expecting a new kid. She said no. 
Thankfully, I had messaged her just as Karen was walking out the door. The supervisor said to bring Spawn to the office. He was sad, but I explained we had to see Mama. I took him to the office after asking a teacher to step in while I was gone. When we got about halfway down the hall, I hear, What do you mean my son can't be here? Supervisor, your son is not registered with our daycare. We cannot accept him. But this is a daycare. I walk in at this point with Spawn in hand and she points to me. Well, she let my son in the room. Supervisor, I know, but she is a sub and she has to go by the roll. Your son was not on the roll, nor is he enrolled here. I'm sorry, Miss Karen, but you and your son have to leave. Spawn is upset at this point because he was getting along with some of the kids, but Karen being Karen had just started back up. This is a daycare. You have a no discrimination policy. You have to accept my son. Supervisor, ma'am, you are right. We have a no discrimination policy, but you have to schedule a tour and an interview if you want to enroll your kid here. This does not mean it's a walk-in daycare. Please just leave. I'm just standing there with Spawn holding my hand. She snatches Spawn from my hand and swears, this will not be the last time you hear from me. The supervisor tells me to go back to the classroom and not to worry that I made a good call about the mom. The rest of the day goes by smoothly. I go to my real job without a worry. The next day, the supervisor emailed me with an update about Karen, pretty much saying, Hey Mary, just wanted to let you know that you did a good job yesterday handling that lady. And yes, she did call the director of the daycare trying to get us in trouble for discriminating against her because guess what? She's Italian. I mean of all things, but I digress. The director said don't worry about anything and that you are more than welcome to sub here more often. The kids love you. Have a good rest of your day. I don't officially know what happened to Karen, but I do know from the email the director told her to shove off. Would you watch Karen's kids if she tried to force you to do it? Please let us know. You're lucky if you get to watch my angels. Am I the jerk for overreacting when my mom tried to endanger my health? The incident that really upset me happened a month or so ago. I, 16, female, had been getting really dry skin around my eyes and kind of looked like a panda as the area was red. I told my parents about it and they asked me not to wear any eye makeup for a week or so to see if something was irritating it, as it wasn't painful. Sure, makes sense. A few days after, I asked my mom if she had any heavier moisturizer I could use, as I know she uses some. She told me my dad had got moisturizer from the doctor for eczema on his leg and that it wasn't prescription, just something you could pick up at the shops if you knew what you were looking for. I agreed to try it, so she passed me a box. It had a prescription label on it. Immediately I was confused, so again asked her what it was, but she just told me to stop being dramatic and just to use it. I opened the box and it does look just like a tube of moisturizer, but I read the little slip that comes with it. Do not use near or on the eyes can cause cataracts. I refused, saying it wasn't for the eyes. I was again told I was being dramatic, and my mom asked my sister for her opinion, and she agreed with my mom. I just refused and went downstairs, saying labels are there for a reason, etc. I told my dad about it when I went downstairs. Turns out that tube wasn't moisturizer. It was steroid cream. So, pretty awful to put on your eyes. He was pretty shocked, to say the least. My mom still refuses to admit she did anything wrong at all, saying I was being ungrateful as it would have worked just fine and making a big deal out of nothing. I'm so confused because I thought that would be kind of a big deal. Am I the jerk for reacting this way? Would you have put on the cream if Karen had told you to or not? Please let us know. Mm, shut up and put on the cream. How I got my boss fired when he tried to fire me. Starting out, let me explain why there wasn't a mass walkout and why I am the only one that quit despite us basically being terrorized at work. The job market was in shambles in my city at that time with something like a 40% unemployment rate. I knew someone with a doctorate degree in theoretical physics working at a local fast food joint as it was literally the only place hiring. The city had quick access to four research universities but he got downsized due to lower admission rates. He is now the dean of the physics department at his former school. To quit any job, no matter how bad, was not smart and a guarantee that you would not find a new one. I always worked customer service, food service, and hospitality since I was 14. At 24, I decided it was time to find a job with benefits and potential for career advancement, so I took a job stocking shelves overnight with a global monstrosity that started out as a mom and pop store. I felt right at home. I worked hard and constantly took the worst jobs and the worst days off 
to make sure I would be there on the weakest staffing days to rub elbows with management. If there was anything that occasionally came up that no one on the shift was trained to do, I would come in on my day off, without pay, to get trained how to do the task, like keys, paint, accounting issues, etc., to become less disposable and more versatile. It worked! And 10 months in, I found myself with an offer to promote to low-level management starting January 1st. Starting the weekend before Thanksgiving, the overnight manager started to understaff shifts to preserve his end-of-year bonus and acted surprised when people called out. He would then bully us into staying over with threats of write-ups for not finishing our assigned stocking tasks. Upper management was notorious for just signing off on write-ups without looking into their validity. So each staff being assigned 13 plus hours of labor to complete alone in six hours, while typically it was approximately four and a half hours to account for tending to customers as well, was no defense. Since an employee could only get two of those write-ups in a rolling 13 month period before termination, we all would stay over as well as skip our breaks and lunches to finish. Those write-ups were also less job threatening as he would simply turn a blind eye to us clocking out for break slash lunch and returning to work. But there was a catch. Since any approved overtime would count against his $73,000 bonus, approximately 11 cents per approved hour, he would never file the approval forms for the overtime. This meant that it was considered unapproved, meaning that we were required to get approval to cut hours off our regular shifts to equal out what we stayed for. He, of course, never approved us to cut these hours. This was resulting in weekly write-ups from the same manager for unapproved overtime on those of us that made it to work every day despite the weather and missed holiday get-togethers with our families. Every week we would get our write-up and he would get praise for getting everything done with less approved staffing hours than typically allocated. Thankfully, write-ups for unapproved overtime didn't carry a lot of weight, but for three months they counted against your points for promotion opportunities. This went on until a week before Christmas. When I got my weekly write-up, I was told by the store manager, who offered me my position, I would be suspended for overtime abuse the next time my manager submitted a write-up for unapproved overtime hours. Determined to not lose my promotion, I started telling the manager no. The second time I refused to stay over without him signing an overtime approval form and giving me a physical signed copy before I hit overtime, he wrote me up for abusive actions towards a member of management and actions with intent to undermine the integrity of management and store policies. This instantly cost me my promotion, which greatly upset me. And then, like the idiot he is, he left me alone in his office to sign the write-ups and the acknowledgement that I was no longer promoting. Initially, I was going to just accept it and resolve myself to spending the next 13 months working my tail off for minimum wage and go up for promotion as soon as they fell off. When I started reading the acknowledgement form, I found I was not eligible to promote to management until I was write-up free for five years. This meant six years and one month before I could even try to get promoted again, all because I followed policy. So rather than sign it, I wrote buzz off and Sharpie across his brand new desk, which he got for being such a great manager, walked out of his office, handed him my vest and name tag, shredded the write-ups and tossed them into the air like confetti and told his no longer smug face that it was now my personal mission to get him fired. He lost his attitude when it sunk in, I just quit. I could see little beads of panic sweat forming on his forehead as he realized that the only person capable of performing certain highly essential functions for his shift was walking out the door. He shouted after me, telling me that he could talk to the general manager and see if he could get the time frame cut down to three years. He offered to approve all of my overtime the rest of the season, offered me a cut of his bonus and several other offers I can't remember. Honestly, if he had offered to withdraw the write-ups, which was still 100% an option but he never offered, I would have accepted it, but I might not have followed through on my threat. I was too angry and too determined, and I didn't care if I became homeless, as long as I never had to work there again. Now, how did I get him fired? Well, due to certain ADA requirements, I was permitted to carry a voice recorder with me at work so I could record important meetings, announcements, and reminders. When I got written up the first time for unapproved overtime, I started recording his requests to both me and coworkers. I never used them to dispute the write-ups, but I never deleted them either. So I uploaded all the recordings to my computer, nearly 18 hours of audio, and sent it to the home office, CCing every store manager and compliance officer in the district. When I went in for my last paycheck, he was long gone. I was offered my promotion back, but I declined. The regional director then offered me my old manager's job 
with a $73,000 hiring bonus. Wonder where that came from. But I still refused and said I was never returning to retail. My former manager's boss laughed and told me that everyone returns eventually, and when I did come see her, she would find me a management spot somewhere. After five months of being unemployed, living with my mom, and barely surviving, I moved to another state and got a job working in a state prison as a guard, and am very fulfilled. Have you ever had a boss you couldn't stand? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I've never had a boss because I've never had a job. Leave everything you have to our kids. I'm 39, successful, and quite well off. My siblings sadly are not. My brother, 42, has three kids. My sister, who's 35, also has three, with one on the way. My youngest sister, who's 28, is married and pregnant, but she had nothing to do with the events of this post. We were all raised to believe that money doesn't matter and all you need is a happy marriage and lots of kids to live a happy life. Being poor and having a lot of kids was somehow glorified, maybe because that's the way our parents lived and wanted to convince themselves that they didn't mess up. Fortunately for me, I didn't buy into that nonsense. I always knew that I never wanted kids. I focused on my career and achieving success. Today, I have my own house, wonderful pets, and a loving boyfriend. My family, however, seems to think that there's something wrong with my lifestyle. My parents have often commented that my five-bedroom house is empty without any kids running around. My siblings often tell me that I'm selfish for not having kids and actually enjoying my life. However, their disdain for my selfish lifestyle doesn't stop them from begging for money. My brother and sister have called me and asked me to help pay their bills. Now, if it's something serious, like clothes or school supplies for their kids, I'm willing to pitch in, but I always refuse when I'm asked to pay for trips to amusement parks, etc. I also paid for my parents to stay in a high-end assisted living facility. They're my parents. I felt like I owed them this much. I have moved them to a less luxurious facility because of something horrible they did. I'll make a post about that too, if you're interested. However, I couldn't help but feel insulted when they sang praises for my siblings for breeding and following in their footsteps and how my parents wish I had done the same. As if, among all their kids, I'm the biggest disappointment. For this reason, I've distanced myself from them. I only call or visit to check up on them and don't let them be a part of my life. The other day, I got a call from my sister asking if she, her husband, my brother, and his wife could all come over. I said okay. They asked me to leave my fortune to their kids in equal portions, and if I did, they would stop asking me for financial help. They said this as if they were doing me a favor. You don't have kids, so who are you going to leave it to? Asked my brother. I told them I was going to leave my money to charities and that I don't owe them crap. When they went on the, you're selfish, tirade, I told them to get lost. The next morning, I got a call from my dad telling me they were disappointed in me. I simply hung up. The one family member who has stood by me is my youngest sister. She actually has her crap together and I could not be more proud of her. Edit. Here's what my parents did to deserve the downgrade. After the altercation with my siblings, my parents tried a different strategy. They tried to sweet talk me and suddenly their tune had changed from, you're so selfish, to, aw, we didn't mean it, let's talk. So after they kept pestering me to have a word with them in person, I invited them over. Now, my parents know darn well that chocolate is bad for dogs, but my mom has tried to give them some on many occasions. When I tell her off, she always comes back with, but maybe they like it. And I was just being nice. This time when they came over, I left them in the living room and went to the kitchen to get some refreshments. While I was there, one of my dogs came over to greet them. I could see them from the kitchen. My mom petted him for a while, then reached into her purse and pulled out a bar of chocolate. She broke off a piece and was about to give it to him when I stormed over and knocked it out of her hands. My parents looked shocked. I was enraged. Even after being told repeatedly that chocolate is bad for dogs, they just don't get it. When I asked my mom what the heck she was doing, my dad actually started yelling at me and told me I was being rude. I told them either they were complete idiots or they were intentionally trying to hurt my dog. I told them I was sick of their BS and that they were on very thin ice with me. When they tried to argue back, I grabbed my dad by the arm and walked him out of the door. My mom followed. This was less than a month ago and a few days ago, they were moved to a much less cushy facility. They won't be mistreated, I would never allow that to happen, but all they'll have are nutritious meals, medical care, and a television they'll have to share with the others. The nice, fully furnished mini apartment they had earlier with all kinds of luxuries will soon be a distant memory. If you built a fortune of your own, who would you leave it to when you pass on? Please let us know. How about my kids? 
Am I the jerk for cutting my daughter off because she went over on our utility bill? I'm 48, female, and my daughter is 25 and a recent single mom of two toddlers. Her late husband, 24 at the time of his passing, was trying to start a business and left her with a lot of debt that he didn't tell her about. I admit that he probably expected sunnier days financially speaking soon, but at the same time, I never liked the boy. I felt like he was too soft at everything he did. My daughter is left with a lot of debt. They were sending their kid to a private special needs school and she begs that I cover the tuition for that, along with the utilities slash gas for her apartment. At that moment, I become shaky on my confidence in my daughter's decisions, so I make her a deal that she forwards me the utility bill for the next three months and that she cannot go over $200 a month. First two months go by okay, but this month, I see that her bill comes out to about $215. She explicitly broke her side of the deal, so I told her that I will not be financially supporting her or her kids and that she needs to either secure more shifts at her hotel housekeeping job or attempt to get a loan. She starts calling me cold-hearted and says that it was because her son was on the computer doing learning games and now her son will have to be put in a public school where special education is weak. However, we had a deal and I remind her that she could have continued working instead of hitching her horse to somebody who is barely making ends meet for their family. Am I the jerk? My husband, who's 57, and my daughter's father both cut contact with her after she got married for a lot of complicated reasons and says he supports my decision. He says he raised her to be self-sufficient and strong and it's embarrassing to see her beg for money. Whose side would you be on? The moms or the daughters? Please let us know. I think that Karen needs a smoothie. So you need a certified copy of my bachelor degree that you just issued? No problemo. During my last semester of my bachelor degree, I already applied for the master's degree at the same university. So I go through the normal application process and get accepted. But as I didn't have my bachelor degree at this point, I had to produce a certified copy of my degree as soon as I could. Yes, I had to give a certified copy of my bachelor's degree to the university who issued that degree in the first place. And no, these were not different departments. It was all done by one lady in the examination office. But whatever, weird bureaucracy is weird. And boy, was it annoying at that university because all students of my faculty had to go through one lady. And I think she just hated to do anything. Like seriously, she was so annoyed when you showed up at her office to just do anything. When I turned in my bachelor thesis, she straight up said that she is so annoyed that all the students turn their thesis in at her office. Well, we don't have another choice. There is seriously no other way to turn your thesis in and don't ever think about asking her for anything. So I'm already looking forward to picking up my bachelor's degree. No, we don't have a fancy celebration. Normally you would get an email when your degree is ready, but as she hates our guts, you just have to guess when it's ready. We don't get an email. Two weeks after your last grade is put in the system, it's probably ready. So I did just that. I show up at her office and hooray, my degree is ready. Lady, here, without even looking at me. Me, thank you. I need a certified copy of that. Lady, really annoyed. Excuse me, what? Me, I need a certified copy. Could you please copy it and certify that it is a copy of the original? I know what a certified copy is. You can get that at Town Hall. Me, I know, but I can also get it here. I know for a fact that you have to give me one if I request it. Five second staring contest ensues. Lady, ugh, fine. She takes my degree back, turns around, copies it, and signs that it is a certified copy. Lady hands me the degree and the copy. Here. Me. Thank you. Now I would like to give you a certified copy of my bachelor degree for my application for the master's degree. I hand her back the certified copy. Are you serious? Me. Yes. I thought if I'm already here, I could turn that in as well, so I don't have to come back again. Another five second staring contest. Lady just takes the copy out of my hand and turns around. And with that, I left with the biggest grin on my face. What did she expect? That I go to the town hall, 15 minute ride, wait there for probably one to two hours, get a certified copy that would cost me 13 euros? At uni, one was for free. And then come back another day? Heck no. Especially because she had the weirdest office hours ever. It was something like two days a week for one and a half hours in the morning on one day and one and a half hours in the afternoon. So I probably would have waited days to turn that in. But her face when I asked for a certified copy was just glorious. Edit. Okay, this blew up way more than I thought. I'm so glad to hear that I'm not the only one experiencing it. And yes, this happened in Germany, but I can't tell a university without maybe getting in trouble. Also, thank you for the gold, stranger.
entitled girlfriend wanted something shiny for her birthday. This was 15 years ago. Back then, I was dating a girl who turned out to be much more than she let on at first. I had been dating this girl for 5 months and things were going great. We hung out a lot and I got to say I really enjoyed her company. She wasn't just a girlfriend, she was someone I really liked chilling with. Her birthday was coming up and I really wanted to do something awesome for her. She had told me a couple of times how much she wanted to go to a hockey game at the Bell Center to see a Montreal Canadiens game. I figured this was the best opportunity to see that she finally gets to go. After asking around, I was able to get tickets to see the Montreal Canadiens play against the visiting Pittsburgh Penguins. At that time, two of their most famous players were on the team. So not only would she get to see a Canadiens game, she would also get to see two of the most famous players at the time live. The day of her birthday comes, so we go out for dinner. After dessert, I hand her an envelope with a thoughtful greeting card I knew she would like, along with the game tickets. She rips the envelope open, not even reading the greeting card, holds up the hockey tickets, and disappointedly asks, What's this? I then explain to her how she's always wanted to go see a hockey game, and how the Pittsburgh Penguins would be the visiting team, and how I got some really good seats a few rows up behind the player's bench, how I spared no expense. She was not impressed in the slightest. I appreciate the thought, but this is the kind of gift I would expect to get any other day. This is my birthday. I expected something shiny. I paused for a moment because I honestly thought she was trolling me or just wanted to make me sweat for a second. But no, she was dead serious. She shoved the tickets into her purse and then told me that she would give me a chance to make it up to her. You're probably thinking that she was right to be disappointed because hey, hockey tickets, right? Well, truth be told, in Montreal, a night at a Canadian's hockey game is by no means a cheap date. The tickets themselves went for $350 for the pair. Montreal loves its hockey team and tickets are hard to come by. This drives up the price. Not to mention these were great seats. The cost of parking is astronomical. Not to mention the cost of anything from the concessions is a pure rip. I kid you not. Four hot dogs, two fries, and two Cokes goes for like $50 Canadian. So adding it all up, it's a very expensive night of about $450 to $500. From then, the relationship took a hard left turn. Her attitude changed. She wasn't the same person anymore. I was truly turned away by her lack of appreciation of the gift, and truly, I started giving less and less of a crap. I broke it off with her, and I was upset that it was over. Up until the birthday fiasco, things were amazing, and I truly believed she would be the one. Two weeks go by, I get a call from her mother. It seems that she liked me from the couple of times she and I met. She seemed to be genuinely concerned about how things went bad between her daughter and I, so we talked for a bit. This is how I got to understand where my ex-girlfriend's sense of entitlement came from. She asked me if I was doing okay. I replied honestly that I was upset and hurt that things turned bad and how I was happy until things changed. I expressed my disappointment at her reaction towards the gift. She asked whether I would go back with her if things would be as they were in the beginning, to which I said yes. If you want her back, you need to show how much you love her. Get her a ring. She will take you back if you do that. I felt as if I had suddenly sobered up from a night of partying. Instant clarity. I conjured up all my willpower to keep myself from telling her to forget herself and to take her daughter with her. I simply replied with, thank you for wanting to help me with this. I have a lot to think about. I will surely be speaking to you soon. I ended the call. It took me a few days to let all that anger boil away. Entitled mom claims car wash damaged Entitled Kid's car even though we had evidence the car was already damaged. Okay, so I work at a car wash and about a week ago, a kid comes up to me claiming that the wash had scraped the bumper of his 2020 Mercedes. Me. Well, looking at it, that appears to be where someone hit some concrete. Nothing in the wash would cause that kind of damage. Entitled Kid Well, it wasn't like that before going into the wash, and now it's destroyed. Me Okay, well there is a process to this. I'm going to get some information from you and then take some pictures. After that, I will investigate it and call you in a couple of days. Entitled Kid Okay, who do I take my car to to get it repaired? Me Well, no one yet. First I have to investigate it, and then I'll give you further instruction. Well, what is there to investigate? The car wash damaged my car. Case closed. Me. I understand how you feel, but I have to. It's our policy. Entitled Kid. You can't be serious. This car costs more than your house. 
And you expect me to drive around like this for days, waiting for you to pull some BS? I'm calling my dad. He's a lawyer. Me. Okay. Well, now there is nothing I can do for you. Since you've decided to get legal action involved, you have to deal with our legal team. Let me grab you their number. Entitled Kid. Yeah, you had better do that. My dad has never lost a case. At this point, I step inside to grab the corporate number and he holds his phone up to his ear to make a call. I grab him the card and hand it to him and walk back inside. About an hour goes by when I see another nice car pull into the exit and fly up to the wash office. Entitled Mom. Are you the manager? Me. Yes, ma'am. How can I be of help? I want to know what makes you think you can talk to my son like he's trash. Me. Ma'am, I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. A little background for you. I've been described as one of the nicest people most people know. I'm always smiling. I apologize too much and constantly have a caring tone to my voice. So I was genuinely confused what this lady was talking about. Entitled Mom. Your wash ruined my son's car, and you told him to go forget himself. Remember now? Me. Oh, yes. He was here about an hour ago. Yes, I tried to get a damage claim going, but he said that his father was a lawyer and was going to sue us, so I gave him the number for our legal department. B.S. He told me what really happened. You lied that there was nothing you could do, then tried lying about how the wash couldn't have damaged his car. Then you wanted to make him wait weeks when you messed around, hoping he'd forget. He had to call his father, who is a lawyer, just to get you to pay attention to him. Me. Ma'am, I explained to your son that there is a process. It takes me about two days to investigate what happened and get him taken care of. He chose to instead yell at me and threaten to sue the company. Well, of course he did. It doesn't take a genius to see that his car was messed up from the wash. It went in brand new and came out deformed. I'm surprised this place is still in business. Now get me the number for your mechanic before I have to call my husband. Me. Ma'am, I'll tell you what. Give me one minute and let me look into something. Before she could say a word, I turned around and went back inside and got on the viewing computer. There are several cameras that video your car going in so we can see all prior damage. And right as he entered, there it was. Me. Okay, ma'am. I was able to look at the cameras of him entering the wash. If you'd like to come take a look, I'll show you. I don't have time for this BS. She walks in and sits down. I show her the video and show her him entering the tunnel. Me. So you can see that this is the video of him entering the wash. It was clearly already damaged before the wash. Entitled Mom. No, no, no. This is photoshopped. I know for a fact his car left the house today in perfect condition. Me. And that's very possible. But somewhere along the line, he damaged it after that. But before the wash. And here is the proof. No, this doesn't prove anything. But it's fine. Hope your crappy car wash has a great lawyer. You're gonna need them. Then she leaves. As she was leaving though, she ran over a parking cone we had out for distancing. I think I now know how the car got damaged. Speaking of Mercedes, what's your favorite car of all time? Please let us know. Easily a tie between Mercedes and BMW. But you peasants wouldn't know about that. Entitled Teacher's Kid gets absolutely wrecked. This is the tale of how an entitled and borderline sociopathic classmate of mine had her academic life ruined before it had even started over some petty BS. Allow me to introduce her. I'll call her Karen Jr. Karen Jr. was a pretty decent student who made equally decent grades. Certainly nothing to scoff at. However, she didn't take any particularly hard classes, and it seemed as if she was merely skating by in school, waiting for the greater things in life. She was also a mythic jerk. She had money and often flaunted it. She looked down at kids who didn't have as much as she did, and was a classic case of spoiled jerk syndrome. She also had a habit of sending her mom on anyone who dared to rub her the wrong way. Let's talk about her. Her mom worked at this school as a math teacher and was very chummy with most of the other teachers, as well as the administration of both the school and the local county board. She was also a jerk. She would intentionally fail high-achieving students who might make her precious daughter look worse in the long run. We'll call this teacher Karen. As for myself, I was a senior in high school at the time of all of this, class of 2019. I'm currently a college sophomore. In high school, I was one of the top students in my class. 
My undergraduate studies have been entirely paid for by academic scholarships, and I was one of a handful who were poised to be valedictorian for our class. Of course, this title didn't mean much to me. I worked my butt off for scholarship money, not for some silly title. I'm saying this now not to brag, but because it's important to the story later. It's also important to note that this story takes place in the thick of college admission season. Seniors were scrambling to write essays, get important documents together, and raise standardized test scores before it was all said and done. I mostly only ever had class with Karen Jr. when I was taking courses required to graduate. These weren't hard classes at all and certainly were not weighted. Typically, my other classes would be AP or dual credit courses to academically challenge myself and to raise my GPA for scholarships. I rarely had class with Karen Jr. in any of these courses, and the class size was so small for APs at my school that if she had been, we would have been in the same class for sure. This was very odd, as she struck me as capable to handle the course load. That's when it began. You see, Karen Jr., like many other folks at this time, had also been trying to raise her test scores for college admissions. She claimed that she had anxiety, and as a result, she got some special accommodations whenever it was time to take tests both for classes and standardized. However, she was notoriously extroverted in class discussions and never struck me as the nervous type. I have dealt with generalized anxiety disorder for years and I wasn't buying it. I also didn't want to use this as a cop-out to get special privileges, but if that's what the psychologist's note said, I didn't have an issue with it. For regular class tests, this meant that she got to leave the room and take her test somewhere else. She typically went to the library, where she could take it in a more isolated setting. There was a rare situation where we did share a class, AP US Government. The teacher was also great friends with Karen. At my high school, it was known as one of the easier AP classes due to the heavy focus on vocabulary and the lack of challenging concepts. We had tests in there on a two-week basis after covering the material in the textbook. I would study my butt off for each and every test and I always ended up with low A's. This was fine in my book, since the other assignments would keep my grade above the 95 mark. As per usual, Karen Jr. would leave class every two weeks to take the test. This was all well and good, and she got a 100 on every single test. She's a capable student, but she's certainly no genius. She would also flaunt to her friends how she never studies for any of her tests because she just gets it. This continued for the first little bit of the course, until one test day. The library was closed down after some water damage had been uncovered and a pretty bad storm. She couldn't take the test in the library as usual and had to take it with the rest of us. She seemed hesitant, but the teacher insisted that there was nowhere else suitable in the school for test taking, and so she took the test and gloriously bombed it. I don't know exactly what she got, but she had shed a few tears as soon as she saw her grade. She claimed that it had been misgraded by the Scantron and insisted that it was rescored she got the same score. I assumed that it was due to her anxiety and I felt bad for her. That sympathy went away in an instant when, during class, she whispered to one of her friends that she had always go to her mom's classroom instead of the library to take her tests. I always had a skill for eavesdropping since I was a relatively unassuming person who didn't say much in class. I didn't know what this meant for sure, but I assume her mom, Karen, had looked up the answers for it. That explained immediately why she had gotten perfect scores on the previous tests and why she had bombed this one. However, her blatant cheating didn't affect me one bit, so I turned a blind eye and kept doing my own thing. Then the situation escalated a slight bit. See, her anxiety also allowed her some special privileges for taking standardized college placement exams like the ACT and the SAT. One of my friends had a sister who genuinely had a learning disability and absolutely needed the extra time. She was incredibly sweet. We'll call the sister Destiny. Destiny explained to me that when you present to the SAT testing facility with accommodations, you had two options. You could either take each of the four ACT sections, five sections if you took it with writing, on separate days under normal time constraints, or take all of the sections on the same day with double the time on each section. Destiny also explained that all test takers with accommodations took the exam on the same day different than normal test takers, so that they could ensure that each student's needs could be met. Destiny mentioned how Karen Jr. got a special room to take her tests in, not unlike her regular tests. That's all well and good, she thought, except when Destiny finished her exams, she noticed that Karen Jr. hadn't finished with the rest of the students. She assumed this meant that Karen Jr. had opted for the extended time option. 
until on Karen Jr.'s social media, she posted about how she was ready for day two of ACT testing. Sure enough, she had taken it over the course of several days. All of this meant that somehow, Karen Jr. had taken the ACT with both accommodation options. I wasn't sure how something like this would have been possible. Karen Jr. got a spectacular score on her exam, something like a 32 or a 33. Again, this didn't particularly bother me. Her test scores don't affect me one bit. I decided to take the information with a laugh and move on with my life. This is when it went from annoying to personal. You see, several students, including myself, were in the running to be our class's valedictorian. I didn't care too much since the distinction wouldn't have gotten me any extra money from the college I was planning on attending. It was quite the shock to learn that Karen Jr., beyond a shadow of a doubt, was going to be our valedictorian for that year. To me and many others, this seemed impossible. She hadn't taken nearly as many weighted classes as a lot of us and was a good student at best. Also, Karen Jr.'s best friend was lined up to be the salutatorian, second in class rank. She was also a pretty mediocre student. So how did they both manage to get a higher GPA than us? We had been taking APs since freshman year. The answer came to me as I was eating lunch one day. One of my friends, we'll call him Aaron, had been making up a calculus test in Karen, Karen Jr.'s mom's, room. While he was there, he had overheard some seriously juicy information. Karen was looking at the student transcripts of high-ranking students, including myself, and had arranged for Karen Jr.'s schedule to inflate her GPA so much that it passed my own and the GPAs of other hard-working students. This included taking some online classes from a local college, which I was never permitted to take. This is because the classes were so specific that the credits didn't transfer. We're talking about a college class about proper walking slash exercising technique here. Easy crap. What's more concerning is that these students' transcripts contained very sensitive information that included, but was not limited to, last four digits of social security, home addresses, phone numbers, medical history, approved medication, and academic records of all kinds. Why they had openly whisper about this stuff with another student in the room was beyond me. I didn't want to take this information at face value, so I looked up the list of faculty that had permission to access student transcript information in the first place. Only a handful of teachers could do this. Wouldn't you believe that Karen's name was most certainly on that list? I also ran the numbers myself. It was totally possible to arrange a schedule of BS classes that would exceed everyone else's GPA. The same had been done to Karen Jr.'s best friend's schedule, just not to the same extent. I was livid. That was my personal information, which, if leaked, could cause some serious privacy issues. Part of my social was on there, for heaven's sake. So I decided that I wasn't going to take this line down anymore. I looked up the regulations and codes regarding the sharing of a student transcript without consent, and oh boy, all of that crap is under FERPA law. And if you don't know anything about FERPA, just know that they don't mess around in the slightest. The state penalties alone for sharing student documents with a third party without consent either from the parent, if the student is under 18, or the student itself was a hefty fine, possible termination, and further federal penalties. We're talking possible jail time if the information shared led to consequences for the student whose information was shared. All I needed was proof. Along with Aaron's testimony, I wanted irrevocable proof that Karen and Karen Jr. were doing shady crap. So I hatched a plan. I was in the show choir, and so I had access to some decent recording equipment including some single-use audio recorders. These were used by judges during competitions to give quick feedback on the show and also for student auditions. They were small, discreet, and silent. They also had a neat feature where you could set a timer on the thing to tell it to start recording after so much time had passed. I set the timer so the recorder would start during lunch. Before school one day, I went up to Karen's room to glance briefly and see if she was in there. She was not and her room was not locked. Her classroom was on the second floor, so the stairwell door downstairs alone was locked at night. However, they unlocked these doors before school so that janitors could do spot cleaning before normal class hours. I taped one of these recorders under her chair, set the timer for around lunchtime and her planning period. They were back to back and waited. I went back at the end of the day. I had choir practice and retrieved the recorder before the downstairs doors were locked. They left them unlocked for extracurricular activities because freshman and sophomore lockers were upstairs. I got home and began playing the tape. Bingo. I had my irrefutable evidence. It was all there. Conversations about Karen viewing student transcripts and disclosing that information with a third party, Karen Jr. 
Now, I had another problem. You see, Karen was extremely friendly with the administration, so I had to find someone who I knew would take me seriously and would cooperate, while keeping my identity a secret. Fortunately, my counselor, we were each assigned one based on our last name, was a real stand-up guy, and I knew he'd come in clutch. He also wasn't close with Karen, unlike many of the other counselors and higher-up staff. I went with Aaron to his office, and I took my laptop with the audio file backed up onto it. We presented our case. You see, to file a FERPA violation report, you needed a member of the administration of the offending organization, this included my counselor, to go on record saying that the complaint was legitimate and that further investigation was warranted. The complaint was also anonymous. He gave me his sweet, sweet approval on the form. I filed the complaint and waited. The fallout was glorious. The school's administration was forced to do an objective audit on all of Karen's activity at the school where they confirmed that all of this BS had been taking place. Karen Jr.'s valedictorian status and her friend's salutatorian status were sacked, and another, more deserving kid was presented with the honor. I myself was awarded salutatorian, although this didn't matter to me so much. The school was fined by FERPA for breach of policy, and Karen might get fired. I never found out. I was graduated before all of that took place. In retrospect, she probably wasn't fired over this because she knew folks on the county school board but it's fun to dream. But it doesn't end there. During the audit, they also found evidence that Karen Jr. had been coming to her mom's room during regular tests and copying down answers from the internet, and she faced severe disciplinary action for that. That certainly wouldn't look good on her record. We're talking in-school suspension due to multiple documented violations. The icing on the cake was when they discovered the foolery regarding her ACT accommodations. Turns out her mom had been pulling the string behind the scenes to get her accommodations for that anxiety we talked about earlier. The ACT company takes cheating very seriously and so they voided her pristine standardized testing score which had landed her a full scholarship to her university of choice. The same ended up happening with some of her SAT and AP scores as well for reasons that I never personally discovered. Karen Jr. lost all of her scholarship money from the university and ended up attending an in-state college which took the few scores that were not voided and also weren't fraudulent. Those scores probably weren't nearly as good as her voided ones. All of this news was absolutely buzzing around the school and Karen Jr. was disgraced. I did my part in my graduation ceremony a few months later and all was well. I never intended for it to go so far but I don't feel bad one bit. Revenge is sweet and best served by FERPA. Thanks for reading. Have you ever seen someone cheating on a test? If so, did you tell anyone? Please let us know. Nothing wrong with a little cheating here and there. That's how I graduated high school. Karen at hotel I work at demands I do her laundry. I work at a hotel in a college town. I've seen some madness in my time at the hotel, but have been completely desensitized to it all. I've also met some pretty entitled people. I've been screamed at and attacked, but this particular person has definitely made me question my life and reminded me why I am in college to better my life. Some information about my workplace. We will allow three room moves if necessary. So the room you're assigned to at check-in is the first one. Then if you move, that's the second. Move again, that's the third. If you wish to move another time, then you're being charged for that room. However, this policy only occurs if the person has no valid reason for a room move. Now, if the person's third room ends up having a busted pipe, that's completely different. But this lady in the story is why we have this policy. Also, my job is to check people in and get them what they need and help within the policy at work. My job is not to do guest laundry. I can direct you to where there are laundry services in town that will do it for you, but it is not my job to do your laundry, especially with everything going on. Another thing to add, because of what's going on, I'm not allowed to touch anybody's belongings. I'm not allowed to enter a room unless I am invited into said room. This is to avoid lawsuits and it's a safety measure. Now onto the majestic story. I was working a 3 to 11 shift. I had 10 arrivals. It was going to be a very slow night. A woman came in to check in. We will call her Anna. Anna was not coherent at all. It took a while for her to fill out the paperwork and couldn't understand why I needed her ID. I must have this to make sure you are the person on the reservation. It was clear as day Anna was on something. Upon filling out the paper I handed her, she realized that there was an extra row of tables between her and I, along with plexiglass blocking each other. Anna, what is this? Insert her gesturing to the tables. Me, oh, due to what's going on, we have to have an extra table between us and the guests to ensure both safety. 
Anna. Okay, but why this glass? She taps on it. Me, to ensure both of our safety. Okay, well I don't appreciate you doing this. I'm sorry ma'am, but the tables and glass are here to stay. When I come to the lobby to ask for help, or when I stay here in the future, I expect you to move all of this. I don't like any of this. This is a hotel, and it makes it look like trash. Anna looked like somebody who did illegal things and was very small and tiny. To give context, I'm 5'10". She came up to my chest, maybe. I informed her that taking all of this down when she, and only she, came down to the lobby, that it would be impossible to do, because management says that this has to be up at all times, no exceptions. Also, no. Who made you the queen of the hotel and the owner of my plexiglass? She storms out to her car when I checked her in. She comes back with a luggage cart full of belongings. I put her in 324. She's in the room for two hours. She comes down and demands the bottom floor. I informed her I had no rooms ready on the bottom floor due to the large amount of departures, but I will gladly move her later when they're ready. Anna. What? What do you mean I have to wait? Me. I don't have rooms ready on the bottom floor, ma'am. You'll have to wait till later. No. I want it now. There's no point in going to 324 when I can have the bottom floor now. Me. Again, ma'am. You have to wait for the room move. Nothing is clean. She gets mad and storms off. I go back to cleaning when 30 minutes later, she appears behind me and asks me to write down directions to get to the grocery store across the street. Me. Oh, sure. So you turn left, then left again, go straight and then turn left. I wrote it down and all. Anna. So, I have to do laundry. If I give it to you, you'll do it, right? Me. I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm not allowed to do laundry for guests. I'm not allowed to touch your belongings at all. Wait, seriously? I need laundry done. I need you to do it. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am, but no, I cannot do your laundry. We have a self-served laundry to the right down the hall. I know that. I want you to go down there and do it for me. Me. No, I'm not doing your laundry. Your laundry is your responsibility. Anna gets annoyed and leaves for her car. She comes back an hour later, goes to 324, calls me and demands I come to her room and pack her belongings up for her. Again, I'm not allowed to touch their belongings at all. And even before all of this started, packing up guest belongings was a huge no on policy. I informed her that I will help her move her belongings to the new room, but I will not pack up her items. That is on her. Anna. I don't understand why you won't do it. Me. Ma'am, I've told you. I am not allowed to touch anybody's belongings at all. I can't touch your belongings. If you pack your things, put them on the luggage cart, then I can push the luggage cart to your new room. She agreed to this. I move her to 102. I go to 324 and I push the luggage cart to the elevator. Anna. Oh, here. Anna tried to put her suitcase, which has wheels, in my hand. Again, I cannot touch their belongings. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I can't touch your belongings. If you want, you can put it on the luggage cart and I'll push it. There's plenty of room. No. I want you to pull it to my new room with the luggage cart. I can't move a luggage cart that's full to the top with her belongings and pull a suitcase. Suitcase has wheels, by the way. Also, I have an arm brace on and can barely move the luggage cart forward without being in pain. I have serious carpal tunnel from my years in volleyball and computer programming. Me. No, ma'am. I will not. Please put it on the luggage cart or you carry it. These are the options. She got mad and finally took it to 102. I put her belongings inside the room and run to the desk to find a line in the lobby. I checked everybody in super fast, all are happy, but Anna came to the lobby and cut in front of a lovely woman I was helping. Anna. I need you to do my laundry. I want a nap. Me. Ma'am, you're cutting. Please get in line and I will help you in the appropriate order. I need you to do my laundry. I don't know how to do it. Me. Now shocked. Uh, what? No. I'm not doing your laundry, ma'am. Please do not ask again, for this is the last time I will be telling you no. I will not do your laundry. She gets mad and stomps off. I helped. <laughs> she doesn't know how to do laundry. I helped the guest and the guest looked very confused. Me too, lady. Me too. For the rest of my shift, every 30 minutes she'd come to the desk and ask me to move her stuff from 102 back to 324. <laughs> then 324 back to 102. It got to the point I ended up denying her because I wasn't able to do my actual job. She also complained that the hotel was too empty and she didn't like how quiet it was. 
She asked why it was so quiet. I just looked at her and informed her that what's going on has destroyed our business. That is why it is so quiet. This was a constant complaint. She would also ask for all of the welcome amenities we have that are free. Because they're free, we only give one out to each room. This depends on how many people are in the room, of course. But since she was the only one in the room, she only got one. She kept coming to the desk and asking for razors and shaving cream, toothbrushes and toothpaste, a lot of toilet paper, to which I denied. We aren't a store, we are a hotel. If you need a lot, you have to buy it yourself. She doesn't like me saying no and me remembering I already gave her what she asked for. She then asked if anybody else was in the hotel that would give it to her. I told her no and we note what room already got the free amenities and she won't get any more. Especially since she was only here for one night. Now, it got quiet for the last two hours of my shift. But at 10 p.m., an hour before I left, she called me from 102 and asked for another room move. Not to 324, but to a whole different room. I asked why. She said she didn't feel safe. Okay, I'll allow the room move. I moved her in the system to 208. She called and demanded the exact same thing. Pick up my things for me. Again, no, I can't touch your belongings. She got mad, packed up her own things again. I went to 102 to hand her the keys. I got curious about the room and why it wasn't safe for her, so I asked. Me, what's the issue with the room, ma'am? Anna, I don't like how it looks. Me, oh, um, all of my rooms are like this, ma'am. They're all the exact same. I don't care. I want a different room. If you wish, ma'am. However, this is the last room move. You get no more. Yes, that's fine. Take my stuff to the room. Here's my suitcase. Me, sounding like a broken record and clearly exhausted. I can't touch your belongings, ma'am. Please put it on the luggage cart or you carry it. Oh my god, this is ridiculous. Do you know who I am? Me. Uh, Anna. I am related to Paul McCartney. Me. Uh, uh... My security that is provided to me by Paul McCartney said I am in serious danger. That is why I am here. Me. Ma'am, if you yell at me one more time, you can move the luggage cart yourself. Anna's attitude changed. I moved the luggage cart to 208. When I entered the room for 208, I put the luggage cart in the room. Anna. I don't like this room. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am, but you have to pick either 102, 324, or this room. These are your options. Anna. Whatever. We need to find a different room. Let's go to the next one. I need to look at it. Me. No! You need to pick this room or the other two. What are the other rooms? Why do I have to pick? Me. There was nothing wrong with the other rooms. As of now, you're costing the hotel money. We allow three room moves. If you go over three, we will charge you for the cost of the room. Well, I don't like these rooms. I am Paul McCartney's family member, and my security said I am not safe in those rooms or this one. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am, but you need to either pick this one or the other two. These are your options. Fine. 324. I push the luggage cart to the elevator, go to the third floor, all the way down the hall to 324, and I put the luggage cart in there. Anna. Actually, no. I want 208. I was about to snap. Me. Ma'am, I'm not moving this luggage cart until you figure out which room you want. We sat in the hall for five minutes. Anna. I want 208. I push the cart to the elevator, go to the second floor, push it to 208, I put the cart in 208, and I leave. I'm at the desk working. It's 10.50 at night, 10 minutes until I get off work, when the phone rang. Anna. I don't like this room. I want a different one. I thought about hanging up honestly. Anna. Well, what are you going to do? Me. 102, 208, or 324. Which one do you want, ma'am? I don't want any of those rooms. Then, I will be charging you at the starting rate tonight for the room move. No, I am not okay with that. I am in danger. You are putting me in danger. This woman was clearly on something. I try to be understanding with people with these kinds of issues, but I have had it. I had moved her between all of these rooms five times. I cannot continue to do this for the rest of the night because she's on something and hallucinating. Me. 102, 208, or 324. These are the rooms you're allowed to choose from. Fine. 102. I go back upstairs. Before I moved her rooms again, though, I told her I need all of the keys to the previous rooms. She refuses to give them to me. I told her I will not move her again until she gives me those keys now. 
She gave me the keys. I moved her to 102. I tell my night auditor to take a new set of keys to 102 and to look at every room she had access to and to charge her for every stolen item in the room. All of the towels in 208 had magically disappeared. I finally got to go home. I took a shower, pet my dog and cats, then I got a call from work. Night Auditor 102 wants to move rooms again and said she has only had one room move and that you're mean. I told him everything. He laughed and said, so she needs to pick between 102, 208, or 324? Okay, cool. And that was that. My management said I did a good job being patient and I did a good job following the rules. They gave me an energy drink because of her. Karen demands I stop watching anime. A few months ago, I was having a good time with my friends in the park, chatting, and overall just having a good time. It was getting pretty late, so I had to go because I don't live next to my friends, so I had to take the bus home. Everything was fine until I got on the bus. Now that I think about it, the typical Karen hair should have alarmed me to sit somewhere away from her, entitled mom, and her kid, entitled kid. I sit next to them. The buses in that area had free Wi-Fi and I wanted to watch some romantic anime with my headphones. Somebody touched me, so I turned my head and you would never guess who it was, entitled mom. Hey, what are you watching there? Me, I'm watching anime, entitled mom. That seems like a cartoon, childish. Me, could you please leave me alone? I was quite annoyed because I have realized what is going on at this point, entitled mom. It is clearly a cartoon. Let my son watch. Me. This isn't for kids, ma'am. Entitled mom. It obviously is. You just don't want to share. Then I had an idea, which was kind of bad, but I couldn't stop myself. Me. Sure, why not? Your son can watch it. I hand over the phone with headphones. Entitled mom proceeds to give my phone to her son with my headphones. Few minutes pass, and the entitled kid says, Mom, why are those people hugging so strangely? Entitled mom. Let me see. You can probably guess what was happening in that scene. Evil smile. Entitled mom quickly takes the phone from the entitled kid's hand, unplugs the headphones, and I seriously thought that the socket would break, but it didn't. Phew. You monster! How dare you show things like that to my kid? The bus stops at a random station, which is pretty close to my house. Me. I said it wasn't for kids, Karen. I grab my phone and headphones before Entitled Mom can respond and get off the bus. It was the worst and at the same time best moment of my life for now. I told my friends about this story when I got home and we were laughing so hard, I loved it. P.S. The kid wasn't entitled. I hope I didn't ruin his life, but I'm pretty sure he won't even understand what was happening. I think he was around three or four. Speaking of anime, what's your favorite anime of all time? Please let us know. Jojo's Bizarre Adventure for the win. Karen demands to plan our wedding and throws a Facebook tantrum when I decline. So this happened yesterday and I'm at a loss for words to be honest. For those who have read my previous posts, you would know that I, 31 male, have proposed to my now fiance, 29 female, back in 2018. And other than initial decisions on which venue, we haven't made a single step in further planning our wedding. With everything going on right now, we decided to hold off future wedding plans until the situation is 100% solved. Well, yesterday I was on a Zoom call with several of my cousins just chatting up on things and whatnot. At some point into the call, one of my cousin's wives barged into the conversation and pretty much took over it. She's not well liked at all in our family, so the call ended soon after she invited herself in. Anyways, about 30 minutes after the call had ended, cousin's wife called up my phone and before I could even say hello, she just started interrogating me about my wedding. And when I said that we haven't planned anything yet, she began gushing about how we should hold it at the venue she held hers at, along with catering, DJ, and so forth, even going as far as to donate us her playlist. She said she'll get right to it and she'll handle everything for us. Now, if there was an award for the worst wedding ever, Cousin's Wife would be in their Hall of Fame. First, the venue was a dump in the middle of nowhere with no roads connecting to it from the highway. It was so bad, many of the guests weren't able to find it, so a lot of them were extremely late or ended up getting frustrated and traveled back home. Furthermore, the venue was not handicap friendly, so it wasn't fun for the more elderly and wheelchair-bound guests, including cousin's wife's own brother. Also, the venue had no restrooms available, and the only ones that were available were located about a 30-minute walk away. Adding on, 
When we got to the venue, we saw that there were a lot of cats literally on the guest tables and some guests were horrified to find cat poop at their designated seats and tables. The staff took its time to do something about it, so those guests left soon after. Next, the food. The food itself was terrible. The desserts were in a horrible shape and were nothing but a crumbling crust and fruit paste that had to be scraped onto the plate. The cooked dishes weren't properly stored beforehand and lots of it smelled spoiled, which later turned out to be true since people began complaining about stomach pains. Third, wedding ceremony in the midst of summer at an outdoor venue is not a good idea. Cousin's wife's wedding ceremony was incredibly long, about two hours. Again, it was the middle of summer at an outdoor venue, so it was hot. Not only had staff closed the bar for the two whole hours of the ceremony, we weren't even able to get a glass of water. Fourth, the staff. They were highly unprofessional, and while they did have fans set up at the beginning around the tables and dance floor, they were later picked up and the owner refused to get them out even though people were starting to fry. Finally, the music slash DJ. The music was ridiculously loud, as in take the maximum volume on Gerard 401 speakers and multiply it by 20 times. While of course it's only natural for people to have a different taste in music, let's just say that the playlist Cousin's wife had chosen didn't fit a wedding at all. If anything, it was more suitable for a kid's birthday party. Needless to say, with lack of any ventilation and the extremely loud volume, other than Cousin's wife and her few sisters and friends, the dance floor was mostly deserted. I didn't stay long much either and left right after my fiance began complaining about severe stomach pains which later turned out to be food poisoning. We spent the night at the ER so that was fun. Back in the present, cousin's wife kept running my ear off how amazing hers was and how ours could be just as amazing if we stuck to her plan, meaning copy and paste hers onto ours. When she had noticed I was silent, she was about to pitch her idea to me again but I quickly shut it down. I reminded how a good chunk of her guests ended up with food poisoning, my fiancé included, as well as that several of the said guests later on sued the venue. I then informed her that my fiancé and I have already decided which venue we'd like our wedding to be at and basically informed her that while I appreciate her willingness to help out, our tastes do not match and would prefer to consult people who are more familiar with fiancé and myself. I was upset and wanted to rage on about how her wedding sucked and our grandfather, mine and her husband's grandfather, nearly ended up dehydrated, but I held it in and simply ended the call. I knew she was upset because this was a woman who has rarely heard the word no throughout her life, so I was mentally preparing for whatever hostile fire coming my way and sure enough, cousin hits up my phone and demands to know what I said to his wife because she hasn't stopped crying since we ended our conversation. I told him she decided upon herself to plan our wedding, but I refused. He was a bit hysterical at first, but calmed down a bit after I explained myself. He knows I wouldn't make this stuff up. His wife on the other hand said I called her names, that my fiance hates her. She does, but I've never said anything about it, that we're going to sue her and that my family can't wait until my cousin divorces her. I chuckled a bit and told cousin exactly what I said and even offered to send him a recording of the call. All of my calls are recorded trust issues. He said he'd like to listen to it, so I later sent him the recording. He later called again and said that they had a big argument and she went to spend the night at a friend's. Later that night, it was brought up to my attention that cousin's wife went on social media to say how I'm a horrible person who hates her and is the sole reason of why her marriage is crumbling. However, she soon removed the posts when people who knew better came to defend me and I even made a reply that I can share the recording with whoever's interested. Edit. Guys, I won't be sharing the recording here because 1. It's all in Hebrew. 2. It was offered as a comment on her Facebook post Cousin's wife made but have since removed it as she got caught. Speaking of weddings, have you ever been to a wedding? And if so, did you like it? Please let us know. Oh, I love weddings when the food's good. Am I the jerk for telling my date not to bother coming after she said she'd be 40 minutes late? This happened a while ago and I don't feel guilty but friends keep suggesting to me since then that I was a jerk. Here goes. I spoke to this girl, let's call her Carol, on Hinge and we had a good conversation. She seemed nice. Eventually, we settled on a date and I booked a fun themed restaurant slash bar for 7.30 p.m. the following Saturday. Saturday comes around and we're still texting back and forth a lot during the day. I arrive at the restaurant at 7.25 p.m. and get shown to the reserved table. 
I let Carol know that I've arrived and at 7.30 she messages me back saying that she hasn't left the house yet and it will take her 40 minutes to get to the restaurant. I told Carol that 40 minutes is too long for me to wait and that she should stay at home. Carol then tells me that it's not her fault because she didn't know the date was going ahead. I respond by saying I don't even slightly believe that as we had been speaking about it during that day and she had no reason to believe it was cancelled. Karen then says that she is sorry and that she will come anyway and hopes that we can start fresh when she gets there. But at this point, I'm really turned off and ask her please not to. I have a pizza myself in the restaurant, wasn't going to lose my deposit. And shortly after I finish my food and leave, Carol tells me that she has finally arrived at the restaurant herself. I tell her that I've gone to drop in on some friends who live nearby and she apologizes again. We leave it there. So am I the jerk? Edit. Wow, thanks for all the feedback. To clear up a common question, yes, we both very explicitly agreed a week in advance that I would book that restaurant for that day at that time and there was no suggestion of changing that in the intervening time. When Carol said, I didn't know it was going ahead, was, I think, worse than being late in the first place, it sounded like she was lying to get out of trouble. She more or less admitted that it had been a lie not long afterwards when I called BS. What would you have done in this situation? Would you have stayed there and waited for her to show up or just left? Please let us know. I just want to know what kind of pizza that was. Mmm, pizza, yeah. Entitled parent complains about pain for babysitting. Okay, so I just remembered this glorious story from my time as a coach at my local sports club. Once a year, we would have a giant sleepover in our gym. Imagine 40 to 50 kids with one or two adult coaches and a couple coaches who are teenagers. I was one of the latter as I was 16 at the time. They would all come on a Saturday at around 11 a.m. and we would have all kinds of fun sports and other activities with them inside the gym as well as outside. We would do some barbecue for the dinner and provide breakfast on Sunday morning as well. At around 11 a.m. on Sunday, the parents would pick them up. None of the coaches were getting paid, but we loved to do it for free. The whole thing would cost the parents 4 euros. With that money, we would get bread, cereal, milk, butter, jam, and other stuff for the breakfast, as well as some drinks like water and juice and the stuff for the barbecue. Additionally, we would ask the parents to provide some salad, cake, muffins, or anything else for lunch, afternoon snack, or dinner. We had a lot of parents who complained about preparing food after they had already paid 4 euros. A lot of times, we had to remind people that we are babysitting their kids for a whole day for free. But this Karen took the cake. When she dropped her kid off on Saturday, I asked her for the four euros because she hadn't paid them yet. Karen, I don't have any money right now. I will give it to you tomorrow. While holding her wallet in her hand. Me, looking straight at her wallet. You're really trying to tell me that there's not even one euro in that wallet? Karen, trying to hide her wallet behind her back. No, there isn't. Me, either you pay now at least one euro or you're going to take your kid home. I am not playing that game. I am not going to pay for his food out of my own pocket. Karen, angrily. I am already paying for this sports club membership. 11 euro per month, by the way. So that should be enough. Be careful how you talk to me, young lady. I am paying you right now. Me, excuse me? What? I'm not getting paid for this weekend. I'm volunteering here right now because I like working with the kids. Karen, well then, why do you want my money if you like working with them? Where is the problem if you are volunteering? Me, someone has to pay for all the food he's going to eat, and that is not going to be me. And let me guess, you also didn't provide any salad, did you? Karen, you already want money from me. Why should I additionally prepare food for this? Because you only paid four euros. One of the adult coaches hears what's going on and comes over. Coach, Karen, pay off. I have had enough of your yelling. Your payments for the membership are always late, and now you try to argue about four euros? I know your family and know that you have four euros to pay. As far as I remember, your husband works a pretty nice management position, doesn't he? Karen gets red in the face, I guess out of embarrassment. Whatever. She opens her wallet and throws four one euro coins at me. She then stomps off. Her son, by the way, just stood there and looked very embarrassed. He's a great kid and doesn't deserve this mom. Gladly, we also had some really great parents who were so grateful that we would take care of their kids for free. We often got some extra gifts from them, like a pack of energy drinks. We often had to stay up all night, some candy, or even got offered money. Karen thinks no one wears the diner's uniform at night. Background 
I'm a regular on a national chain of 24-hour diner, known for their breakfast dishes and having the cook station out in the open. Given the odd schedule that I keep, it's one of the few places in town to grab some good food late at night. So I've gotten to know the staff fairly well, and they know me. I also have several friends who have been waitstaff and know how simple things like stacking your plates once you're done is sometimes appreciated as much as a good tip. So I try and do this if there is time. On to the story. So I pull into the diner around 1am and can see that all of the tables are loaded with dirty dishes. So I walk in and see one of the day shift staff starting the cleanup process. Me. Hey, how long have you been here? You look dead on your feet. Worker. Oh, hey, since just before lunch. Jones is sick and I got stuck covering his shift. Me. That sucks. What happened here? Worker. Just had a frat stop by and they left about 5 minutes ago. I need to head in the back and check on something with the cook i.e. smoke break. You okay for a few minutes? Me. No problem, I'm in no rush. So really having nothing to do and no place to sit, I decided to help and start stacking dishes and moving them from on top of the table to the counter next to where the dish sink is located. While trying to be a boy scout, I got a couple of the tables at least cleared. A car pulls up and out pours not one, not two, but four Karens have now been unleashed on this poor unsuspecting diner. So there I was with dishes in hand in the process of moving them from a table to the counter. Not how I wanted my night to go. I much prefer the Karen free nights, not four of them at once. So deep breath, and I hope that these are some of those rare nice Karens who have more than one brain cell shared between them. The door opens and Karen 1 to me. Table for full, now. Me politely. Seat yourselves. The server is in the back working on an issue and will be out shortly. Karen 3. This table is filthy. Get over here and finish cleaning it. Karen 2 stumbles out from the restroom area. There is no toilet paper in the bathroom. Go get some. Karen 4. Coffee! Boys and girls, can you guess my next line? I'm glad that you could. Me. Ladies, I'm sorry, but I don't. Karen 4. BS. We all saw you with those dishes. Don't lie. Karen 1. Now get off your butt and do your job. Me. I was trying to be helpful and give the waitstaff a hand. She's been running almost non-stop for over 12 hours. And what about me says I work here? Do you see a uniform or a name badge on me? Karen 3 Everyone knows you guys never wear your uniform at night. So get to work and make us some food. At this point, worker comes in and has a slight smile on her face from the dishes clumped together on the counter. And then her eyes glance over and sees the Karens and her face just drops. Worker to me I forgot to grab your drink. Sorry about that. Long shift. Me. No problem, but it's going to be longer still. Just deal with them and I'll order after them. It's not worth the headache right now. So worker one grabs a dish rag and walks over to their table and apologizes for their wait and asks what they would like to drink while wiping down the table. The Karens then begin their litany of how dare she serve her coworker first and that I was lazy and not doing my job. Going to complain to the manager, etc, etc. Now, during their tirade, who should come in? Not the shift manager, nor the store manager, or city manager, but the district manager. He lives about 10 minutes down the road, so he pops in frequently. Me. Yo, boss man, how is it going tonight? Manager. Hey, about the same as usual. Karen 1, shouting. Are you the manager here? Manager. Yes, I do manage- You need to fire that lazy employee there. Pointing at me. He was rude and was saying mean things at us. And he's out of uniform. District manager looks at me. I look back and take a deep breath. Me. They just got done from being slammed. Worker one is pulling a double, so I decided to help her out by bussing the dishes to the counter. While I was doing that, they came in and assumed I worked here, and this has been the most reasonable I've seen them so far. Yes, I managed to get my full explanation spoken without interruptions. District manager to Karen one. Ma'am, he does not work here. He's a rag. Who do you think Jesus would approve of? Someone helping those in need or a Jezebel who goes out drinking and making a jerk of herself? Also, it is company policy for everyone from waitstaff to senior management to be in uniform when we are working. So please finish your order, eat and be on your way and do not harass the other patrons. The Karen table is dead silent and staring at each other. They order and finish up their food before slinking out of the door and drive off. District manager to me. I go to the same church as Karen 1, Karen 2, and Karen 4. They always act like Bertha better than you. So it was nice to take that Karen 1 down a peg. Worker. 
I can't believe it. They didn't even bother to leave a tip. All those surprised, please raise your hands. Thank you for letting me ramble and remember to be nice to your servers. Speaking of tips, how much do you tip when you go out to eat? Please let us know. I don't. Am I the jerk for blowing up at my girlfriend after her friend's daughter painted my gaming keyboard? Yesterday, my girlfriend's friend came over to our place with her four-year-old. She comes over a lot to hang out with my girlfriend and usually brings her kid. When they came over, I left to run some errands and cause I don't like third wheeling my girlfriend's hangouts in my own house. I get back after a couple hours and when I come inside, the friend and kid are gone and my girlfriend is apologetic and shows me my gaming keyboard. It was covered in nail polish. I think the cheap kitty kind with a lot of glitter. The keys had been almost completely painted over. My girlfriend had tried to remove it, but it was a lost cause. Apparently, girlfriend's friend's daughter had wandered off when my girlfriend and her friend were talking and went into our spare room slash my game room and had painted the keys. There was paint on my desk too. Not gonna lie, I was furious. I would bought this keyboard only two months ago. It's over $150, mechanical, with multicolored backlights. I ended up yelling at her about not watching the kid and letting her do so much damage. Then I asked what was gonna be done about it. My girlfriend said the kid had been punished but I told her I didn't give a darn if she was put in timeout. I wanted to know if and when her friend was gonna buy me a new keyboard. My girlfriend said she didn't know if her friend could shell out that much in such short notice, but she'd pay me back when she could, and that she didn't like how angry I was being and how I was being disrespectful towards her friend. I again said I don't give a darn. I don't want either of them near my house until she reimburses me for the damage, cause that's unacceptable in my book. Apparently that was too much and my girlfriend said I was being a jerk and it's not that big of a deal right now. It's just a keyboard and I don't use it that much anyways. I got even more upset because it felt like she wasn't taking my hobby or finances seriously. We have barely spoken since and she wants me to apologize for yelling now even though I think me being a little mad is justified. Edit. I've seen this point come up a lot. Yes, I took the caps off to look at the damage. The kid didn't neatly paint on each key individually. There's globs of polish and paint all over the thing. Multiple colors, like it had been poured out or finger painted on. I don't know why she had polish in the first place, didn't ask. Some of the paint ran into the cracks between the keys. My girlfriend got some off. I got a little as well, but a lot of acetone will damage it, even worse than the polish. Even the parts we got off are still sort of discolored, like you can tell something was spilled. The keyboard can still type, but it's a lot uglier and some of the keys stick. It's pretty hard to use it for gaming now. Anyways, I've had time to cool down and to realize I've been a jerk and both me and her could have handled this a lot better. We talked some, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but there were apologies all around. Us arguing almost never happens, but tensions have been high lately. I still don't want her friend over until she apologizes to me herself and I'm kind of against the kid coming around when I'm not here. Anyways, thanks for the space to talk about my problems Reddit. What would you do in this situation? Would you expect the kid's mom to pay for your new keyboard? Or would you just forget about it? Please let us know. Why not just sell the keyboard on Etsy now that it's custom designed? And this is my two week notice. I worked at a local golf course for about seven years from when I was 13 to 20. When I had first started there, my mother was the manager of all things food and beverage until that summer because she took on a different job. Working there for so long put me in line to be the new manager However, I was not willing to take the position because I was enrolled in college and wouldn't have had the time for it. And considering my mother worked 100 hour weeks sometimes in our busy season, I wasn't willing. So they brought in Addie to replace my mother as food and beverage manager and I was another regular employee. The golf course also had a general manager who we will call Chad. Chad sucks. He was creepy towards all the girls who worked there and had a terrible temper, one similar to a toddler. We never saw eye to eye on anything, especially his management style, and he was always getting on my case even though I was the only person on the food and beverage side of things that knew what was up and how to do anything, including Addie. So this brings us to the story. I was working in our little restaurant serving our golf leagues that come in. One league in particular liked to stay really late, like 12 a.m. to 1 a.m., but I never really minded as I got along well with them and I became good friends with a lot of the members after they were always buying beer slash shots, so there was never much of an issue with it. When Addie started there, Chad decided to change up our dining room policies to close the restaurant at 10.30 p.m. This personally really aggravated me. They were paying customers and I was happy to serve them and I was the only one that was usually serving them. 
But Chad kept going on about labor costs, which if anyone reading this knows anything about serving, I wasn't making much hourly and was relying on tips to make money. So they put this into place and I tell Chad it's his responsibility to tell the league they have to leave at 10.30 and not me. He didn't. And guess what? The league members were mad. First mistake. Addy would not often, or honestly never, stay to help with the league, but was adamant about the new hours. As she's about to head out for the day, she tells me that I will be training two girls in the restaurant that night. We have about 80 extremely needy golfers in the restaurant at once on this night in particular. I barely had time to train one, but she did not stay to help out with that. Looking back on it, it was definitely not my responsibility to train anyone either but I was willing to help out as she was still getting adjusted to the job and she knew that and took advantage of that. Second mistake. Then mentions to me that if I am not clocked out by 10.50 p.m., then I will not be paid for any work after the fact. Third mistake. I ended up training one of the girls on our POS computer and told her she was done for the day and that she can clock out and continued to train the other girl for the rest of the evening. So when the league left at 10.30, there was food on the floor, bathrooms weren't cleaned, Trash was not taken out, the tables were moved from their normal resting places, and the drawer wasn't counted. I told the girl I was training to move the tables and I counted the drawer. Well, it's 10.50 now and I'm not working for free, so we clocked out and left. Could I have done more? Absolutely, but I needed to prove a point. The next morning I had many missed calls from Chad and Addie. I didn't have to come in for two days, so I just let them keep calling. So on the next shift day I had, I finally called Chad back. He told me to come in for a meeting with him and Addie. When I get there, he gives me a story about how he had to come in and clean everything up with Addie and why would I ever do something like that. I told him that Addie not only had me training two people on our busiest night of the week alone, but I also had to be out at 10.50 or I was told I wasn't being paid. After going back and forth about how Addie was just kidding and I shouldn't take things so seriously, I had finally had enough of Chad and his antics. I told them I was putting in my two weeks, and the looks on their faces were ridiculous. It was awesome. I continued to work for the next two weeks, doing everything I was supposed to and training Addie on any little detail I could think of before I left. After my two weeks were up, I ended up getting calls from Addie and Chad all the time because nothing was going right. I was asked again by Chad to take Addie's position, and Addie was calling me telling me how impossible Chad is to work with. It was truly beautiful to watch all the chaos unfold even after I left. Addie ended up quitting a month after because her and Chad couldn't get along. I don't miss much about that job or place, but I do miss my regulars every day. If any of y'all are reading this, I hope you're doing well. I've given you my money, now do your job. Sir, you're not our customer. I work for one of the largest Scandinavian airlines at the check-in desks. I encounter some of humanity's worst on a daily basis, but this one in particular stood out to me. It started when I noticed that my coworker at the desk next to me was being berated by this older man. There were no passengers waiting to be checked in at the time, so I ended up listening in on the conversation. In a strangely calm tone, this man was letting out a steady stream of accusations mixed in with total nonsense. Man, I will be contacting all the newspapers to let them know about how you are scamming people out of their money. This is your responsibility to fix, so you will have to fix it. Coworker, I'm very sorry. However, due to this ticket, I gave you my money. So are you going to fix this? This conversation kept looping pretty much exactly like this over and over without my coworker ever getting enough time to explain the problem to the passenger without being cut off. I quietly asked coworker if he needs me to call for a supervisor, but to my surprise, he responded that everything was going great with a grin on his face. With me butting in into the conversation, it finally created enough room for my coworker to finally explain to the passenger what the problem was. Coworker, sir, you are traveling with R Air, established Irish low budget airline. We work for S Air. What do you want us to do? Without hesitation, the older man continues to tell coworker off. It is S Air that got my money. So it's your people who are going to fix my ticket. Coworker, there's nothing we can do with this ticket as it's for a different airline that we have no affiliation with. If you want our help, you will have to visit our ticket office. He points in the direction of the ticket office. Man, I've already given you my money. Why would I give you even more? At this point, it's been over 20 minutes of this 
and both me and coworker are starting to get fed up by this man's antics and I walk around the corner to stand next to the man. I gesture towards the ticket office and as politely yet forcibly as I possibly could, I shut down the conversation by telling him that there is nothing we can do for him at the check-in counter and that he will have to go to the ticket office for help. He grumpily starts walking towards the office while continuously telling us how bad at our job we are. And that was the end of it. Or so I thought. About an hour passes by and I've switched over to helping people out with the self-check-in machines. I'm having a conversation with my supervisor about nothing of any importance when suddenly the man returns. He immediately makes a beeline to my supervisor and starts his rambling again, with the only addition from the previous ramble being him telling her how we had apparently managed to talk to the boss. He made air quotes as he said this, about something. He started to become illegible at this point, but he pretty much regurgitated the conversation we had earlier. My supervisor immediately realizes what kind of situation it was and pretty much ended up ignoring him, helping another passenger who was an actual customer of ours, leaving him to continue complaining to the only other worker there. Me. Man. This is nothing personal towards you. But, and the previous beratements continues on, loop again, with another addition that airlines should not be allowed to sell tickets through mobile apps and that he is going to contact politicians about it to change the rules and that he is going to speak to the president of the S Air so that he, the president of S Air, can talk to the president of R Air so that he, the president of R Air, had to speak to his employees about how to treat their customers. Again, everyone he's spoken to up until this point works for S Air. Turns out, this man had bought a ticket with R Air through a travel agency without checking which airport the departure was from. The airport I work at does not have any R Air departures or arrivals at all. This man was at the wrong airport, demanding us to check him in at a different airline, refusing to believe us when we told him he's not our customer. In the end, he ended up just leaving. The funny thing is, he was only going to Copenhagen, which there are many very easy ways to get to. He ended up spending almost two hours at the wrong airport telling us to do someone else's job. Even if he had just bought another plane ticket or gotten on a much cheaper train, he would have been well on his way by then. Karen got our car towed on our property. I'm pretty upset because this happened just a few hours ago. Anyway, to set the stage as players, we've got me, my neighbor, who from here on will be referred to as nosy old bat. And yes, she's an entitled boomer. Her husband, nice neighbor, my brother, mentioned rather than involved, and my grandmother. For some backstory, neighbor and I both live on corner houses next to a busy street, which is relevant to the story. And oh man, is this lady bordering on r slash insane people level of crazy and nosy because oh my god, she's nuts. I've lived in this house my entire life with my grandmother. I'm 28 and where I live, it's hard to live on your own, especially with everything going on right now and being temporarily out of work because finding work that's disabled accommodating is a pain. Especially when you have asthma and it makes people paranoid. I get it, but it's tiring trying to explain that no, I'm not sick. I have asthma and I can't get anyone else sick with my bad lungs. A neighbor used to watch me for a little bit when I was six until my aunt could pick me up to babysit me. This apparently has given her the mindset that she can attempt to control my life and tattle on me to my grandmother, who nowadays knows when I have company and if a friend parks in the driveway, I call or text her to let her know and ask her to let me know when she'll be home so I can tell my friend they need to move their car unless grandma tells me that it's fine and she'll park on the side of the street, which she does occasionally, even if there's no one in the driveway. A non-issue, right? Not to neighbor. She's been known to get up in my business to go and knock on my door and demand to know who's there and if I'm doing the nasty with those friends. It's hilarious to me when people ask if I'm sleeping around, but it's infuriating when neighbor asks this because she's nosy as heck and thinks she practically owns the neighborhood due to the aforementioned corner houses and acts as if this is an HOA. It, it's not, and she's in charge, as should we be because of our house on the other corner. She makes calls on other people's behalves constantly. We're no different. Anyway, dressing the stage aside, the story of the title. All right, so my little brother is a Marine and is currently deployed in Hawaii, and his car has been on our property for a while now because, well, he can't come home and drive it since he's in Hawaii. This apparently gives her the idea to call a tow truck because it hasn't been moved since he left it. 
It's not even a terrible looking car either, but I guess it upsets her that it was sitting there due to it being a car she didn't know. My grandmother's now dead truck has been there longer, but neighbor knows whose it is because she's seen her drive it. This happened between the time my grandmother and I left for Costco and the time we got home. Neighbor called the towing company to tow my brother's car because, in her batty old boomer logic, after my grandmother went over to her house to confront her, it's been there for over two weeks and it's just sitting there on our property, not hurting anything. Her husband, nice neighbor, as jerky as he can be, was unaware his wife did this because he likely wasn't home, so he had said that he wasn't sure when he talked to us. So now my grandmother has to call the police and the towing company to get the car back and she is rightfully furious, as am I, as at this time it means another towing fee that was completely unnecessary. She can't even get it until tomorrow because nothing is even open. She was met with voicemails of the towing company not even being open either, which was bizarre before 7 p.m., but whatever. I don't know the towing hours since we haven't had to deal with them before. I absolutely hate neighbor with a seething and unholy passion because this isn't the first time she's attempted this garbage either. She's done this on other neighbors because she thinks she can police the neighborhood because of her corner house logic. I do not care how rude this makes me, but I will not be paying that towing fee and I will not be letting my grandmother pay it neighbor will be paying that because it was none of her business to be nosing her old face into things i don't care if you're old you do not stick your nose in someone else's business and life especially if the thing in question is on someone else's property i will take this woman to court if she refuses to pay for this because she had no right to do this i mean what was my brother supposed to do be all like oh hey guys it's been two weeks let me go back to my grandmother's and drive my car around the block i'll be back on monday with all the flights yeah, as if his CO would allow for that just because of neighbor. I'll give updates if anything further happens because, yeah, I'm furious and don't really care if the old woman doesn't want to pay it. She will, or face court for her nosiness. Update. My cranky and tired butt marched over to her house. She was awake and outside and ripped a new one into her about keeping her nose in her own business and to pay for the towing or I was going to take it higher up and nail her for illegally having it towed. She's paying for the tow truck, reluctantly. I haven't slept. Thanks, Insomnia, you're a pal. So I have no hoots to give about being cordial or polite with this BS. Entitled people need to mind their own dang business and leave people alone. What would you do if Karen had your car towed off of your property? Would you force her to pay for it or would you pay yourself? Please let us know. She did nothing wrong. Am I the jerk for leaving a repairman a bad review for flirting with my wife? The air conditioner broke last week while I was out of town and my wife had to call an emergency technician in the middle of the night. A company we'd used before without issues sent a guy over. He fixed the air conditioner no problem, but once he had left, I woke up to a million missed texts and calls from my wife, who was hysterical. Apparently, within minutes of showing up, he made comments about her body and other inappropriate statements. She made it clear she wasn't interested without being outright rude because she didn't want him to get mad and leave without fixing the air conditioner. The tech kept trying to put moves on her. Then after he'd fixed the AC, he didn't leave right away, trying to feed her some lines about how she seemed to be home alone and he could spend the night to make sure she was safe. Eventually, he realized he was driving down a dead end and left. But the whole thing just really freaked her out, having some guy in the house who didn't leave when asked and everything. I was upset to hear about all this and she was shaken up by the incident, so we left a review on their Google and Yelp pages saying what had happened. The company is pretty small, so the owner called me to apologize a couple days later and said the tech had had a few drinks that night, not expecting to be called out to an emergency job and that his sense of humor had clearly been misinterpreted by my wife. He asked me to take my review down because it called the tech out by his first name and apparently a review saying he was coming on to a female customer could cause some personal problems for the guy. The owner also reasoned that the business was an air conditioner repair business, not a bedside manor business, and that they did fix the air conditioner, so deserved a higher rating. I told them our review stands, and they basically said that we were jerks for threatening the reputation of their business and the personal reputation of the tech over a single misunderstanding. On the one hand, they did fix the air conditioner, and that's what we called them to do. On the other hand, I feel like this is relevant information for people considering hiring them, even if it was a one-time thing. Am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Should OP leave up that review telling exactly what happened, or should he take it down like the business is asking him to? Please let us know.
Not only should he leave those reviews up, he should also share them with his friends on Facebook so they can make it go viral. I honestly hope that company goes down the drain. My entitled mother parks in the disabled parking and gets a fine she refuses to pay. My mother is a mega Karen, and I have 16 years of stories to tell about her entitlement. Here is yet another one. This happened in 2004 when I was 14. We had just moved from Australia to New Zealand. The town had a population of around 12,000 people, which was a big step up from the town we moved from, about 2,000 people. It seemed like my mom's entitlement got worse by having an extra 10,000 people for her to annoy. Within a month, my sister and I had settled into our new schools and Mother Dearest found her preferred, cheapest grocery store to shop at. I should mention that my mom is not disabled, but did that stop her from parking in the disabled parking spot? Nope. The first month went fine, until my mother got lazy. Whenever we went to the grocery store, she would always complain, while walking towards the entrance, that there was never anyone parked in the disabled parking spot, and she would say things like, I don't see why I'm not allowed to park there, and there's nobody in this dang town that needs it anyway. This last comment was total BS on her part, as there was a quadriplegic who lived in the town which she knew about, and regardless, these spaces are for disabled people, not her. Then one day, me and my sister were in the car while mum was driving to the grocery store. We usually parked close to the front door, but to the side where there were usually a few spare parking spots. I was expecting her to stop there, but she didn't. Instead, she drove all the way to the front and parked in the disabled parking spot. Me. Mom, this is disabled parking. You can't park here. Mom. Of course I can. The spot is vacant. Me. It's illegal for you to park here. You'll get a fine. Mom. No, I won't. I have the right to park here if there's no disabled person parked here. I don't see any disabled person. Do you? Me. Whatever, Mom. But you're going to get a fine. I get out of the car and walked across the street to the park. I didn't want to be seen with my mom, but I wanted to keep an eye out for the parking officer or police person who I knew would come. Even in a small town, the police were very diligent about rule breakers. And sure enough, 10 minutes later, I saw a policeman walk up to the car check the license and lack of a disabled sticker, and write a ticket that he placed on her windscreen. I sent Mother Dearest a text that I'd meet her at the petrol station when she was done. I didn't want to be seen getting into her car, but I made sure to hang around so I could see her reaction when she saw the fine. Sure enough, 10 minutes later, I saw my mom come out of the store, see the ticket, and she flipped out. She started cursing and stomping her feet on the ground like a kid that lost their toy. Only in this case, it was a fine of $80. I chuckled to myself as I walked to the petrol station a few blocks over. I got there a few minutes before my mom did, and I could see the anger on her face as she got out of the car, slammed it, and started filling up her tank. Me, faking concern. What's wrong, mom? Mom, you shut your mouth. I smiled and got into the car. When we got home, my mom got straight on the phone to debate the parking fine. I overheard the call. Mom, uh, yeah. I got a fine for parking on an empty parking spot. There was nobody else parked there. But I had to park there because I have a bad leg and can't walk that far. What? No, I don't have a sticker, but that doesn't matter. No, hold on, what? But no, disabled. Oh no, you, you stupid, I'm not paying this fine. And she hung up. A month later, I had assumed she paid the fine, but obviously not. She got a letter in the mail regarding an unpaid fine, which was now $100 due to relayed payment. Mom went to the courthouse and paid it, but I didn't hear the end of it for three months after that, as she had complained about it any chance she got, making out like she was the victim. I wish I could say that she learned her lesson, but she didn't. She parked there a few more times and, shock, horror, got more fines. A Karen never learns. Edit. Just to clarify, I am disabled now, but wasn't back then. My injury happened in 2007 when I was 17. I've written the full story on here in case you want to know more. Have you ever parked somewhere that you weren't supposed to? If so, did you get a fine? Please let us know. Plenty of times. I just never pay them. I'm so sorry I got in the way of you embezzling the McMoney. I worked at two McRestaurants. I'm not going to reveal which McRestaurants these may be, but you may work it out. The first was in my hometown before uni for six months. The second was in my uni's town for 18 months. The two McRestaurants had different IT systems. One had an online system, the other just had paper. And so I couldn't simply be transferred. I had to resign from one, get fast-tracked through application at the other, 
and the people who Mick trained me had an easy few shifts. Lead up to being told what to comply to. Now, the first Mick restaurant was very strict, but a bit too easy going. I had good customer service, so I was put on the tills every shift. I could combat every Karen with enough sarcasm and fake boomer humor to make them like me. When working on tills, the managers gave the till users their swipe cards so we could issue refunds quicker or delete an incorrect item on the order when the customer changes their minds 10 times. All is good. Each shift I walk in, count the McMoney, do my job, cash the McMoney, go home. I was almost always perfect to the penny. Until one shift, I noticed a coworker using my till during my break. When I cash the McMoney that shift, I'm down by like a fiver and a few pence, and I'm given a cash retrainer, disciplinary, and basically a pop quiz about cash handling. After doing so, I mention the other coworker to a manager, and he tells me it's my fault for not constantly supervising my till and for not locking my till during my break, which I didn't know I could do. He happily shows me, cool and good. He's nice and even shows me the legal writing that says I cannot leave the till from counting to cashing until the till is locked. I can comply with that. The night I am finally forced to use this knowledge. A year later, new store, new managers, same legal stuff. I offer to take a coworker's shift so I can afford to eat next week and end up on a shift with a manager who has never asked me to go on till before, which is weird. I'm great with customers and despise cooking McFood. This time though, she was expecting the other worker but had already gotten the McMoney ready. I take it from her, count it, sign it off and do my job. I start learning that she is working everyone hard while she picks her nails and checks her phone. After a while, she notices that we haven't had any orders for a little while and that I'm just stood watching her procrastinate. Stop standing around and do your job. Er, I am? We have no customers so I can't serve anyone. She tells me to get stock for the kitchen. What? I thought you wanted me to do my job. Yes, do your job. By the book, McManager? Yes. Okay, no problem. I will stay by this till like it says in the book. Duh. I continue to stand there and she gets irate. Look, McManager, the only way I will leave this till is to go on my break. She rolls her eyes and leaves me alone. Yay, about an hour getting paid to chat with the customers and coworkers who are nearby the till. Eventually, I'm asked to go on my break, so I lock the till as per usual and do so. A coworker of mine, someone who used a flexible till next to mine while I was on break, a flexible till is signed off by a manager, said that while I was on my break, she came to the till, got angry tapping the screen for it to do nothing, and stormed off. When I came back from my break, I asked for her manager card. No, it's for managers only, and you're just a till boy today. Wow, okay, is this an extended break? What? No, go do your job. I'll be able to if you give me your manager card so I can unlock your till and do my job. To be honest, you can supervise since it's your card. Again, she rolls her eyes, goes to the till with me, holds out her manager card, and I have to swipe it while she was still holding it because she wouldn't let go. The screen becomes responsive again and I unlock it. She seems to avoid me for the rest of the shift while I just chill since it wasn't too busy. I have time for a proper laugh with some customers and I even have a drunken friend come in for a milkshake. She and I chat for a while and talk about the weird McManager. End of my shift. The McManager is suddenly very nice and sweet, offers to take my McMoney and count it up for me, and I can go home early. Haha, <laughs> no. I'm paid to the minute and want to cover my own butt, so I count it myself. Not quite perfect, three pence over. I probably just didn't give a few people their penny change when they walked away. But for a cash retrainer, it has to be plus or minus one pound. I'm chill. It was satisfying to irritate her so much while I took the role of procrastinating away from her for that shift. I was grinning on my way home that I had done everything as I should have and put a manager in her place. I even got a drunk friend buddy to walk home with. Turns out there was more to it. That was the most profitable Thursday evening in months. That evening was hundreds of quid more profitable. A little investigation had been carried out because of this. They then noticed it was the first Thursday evening in months to not have a perfect to the penny cash amount. They then noticed that it was me who signed it off, not the normal person. Then they noticed that the signature of the other person didn't match with her signature on other shifts. Far too much for it to be a coincidence. CCTV showed McManager to be taking the Tills McMoney into the office on the usual worker's break every shift. I got in the way of it this time for just doing as told and doing my job by the book. Fired, of course. Find, of course. Think she spent a small amount of time in prison, 
but now I see her cleaning the floor in the Colonel's Chicken Restaurant across the street. Also, I probably would have trusted her to look after the till while I got stuck if she hadn't been so rude. Speaking of McDonald's, what's your absolute favorite item from McDonald's? Please let us know. Oh, don't make me choose like that. Are we the jerks for all moving out and leaving our roommate with the lease agreement he can't afford because he moved his girlfriend in? So my roommate, Jake, rented this apartment with two other people. One of them backed out immediately before signing anything and the other, Jeff, didn't want to sign anything as he needed to be able to move out on a quick note. Jake agreed with Jeff. The condition was that he had sent him his share every month and Jeff would arrange two more roomies ASAP. Well, that's when me and Pete come in. We know Jeff from high school. We needed a place to stay for college and Jeff asked us to live here on the same conditions as he did. Anyways, everything was split four ways, usual stuff. Prior to everything going on right now, Jake suddenly had his girlfriend over all the time. But no one brought it up, as it wasn't uncommon to have your girlfriend over for a few days. We all do it. But when she was here for a full week, made a load of messes, made our utility bill way higher, and literally never left the apartment, we talked to Jake, who informed us that she was staying for a few weeks because she lost her place and her job. We were all pretty upset, pointed out he should discuss crap like that beforehand and how she could at the bare minimum pick up after herself. He simply replied it was his name on the lease so he could do whatever. However, he had talked to her about cleaning up after herself. Obviously, we were upset, but then all heck broke loose in the world and we were stuck with her. It just kept getting worse. More messes, water bill through the roof, kitchen trashed, other people's food disappearing, etc. Despite multiple attempts to speak to them, demanding she pay her share for the rent and utilities, etc., it always ended with, it's my name on the lease. Long story short, we found a new place for the three of us, sent our last month's rent with a notice we were moving out since he is entitled to a 30-day notice lease and packed our crap, which includes 90% of furniture, kitchen utensils, etc., and moved out into our new place. Cue endless messages from Jake stating he can't afford it alone and how he'll go broke and he doesn't know anyone who wants to move in and begging us to come back, even crying on the phone. So we all replied with, it's your name on the lease, bro, right? Now we want to know whether or not we are the jerks since we all feel like we kind of are, regardless of his behavior. Well, what do you think? Are they the jerks or is Jake the jerk? Please let us know. Well, it is his name on the lease, bro. Entitled parent enters my store and demands the police be his lawyers instead of taking his kid to the hospital. So this happened about six years ago while I was working at a retail store next to a restaurant that I have no idea how it managed to stay in business. It was notorious for serving expired slash rotten food with no flips given about it. One day I was at the counter when a man charges in with his family in tow. His wife is carrying an infant in one hand and holding the hand of their other kid in the other hand who looked to be about five years old and was quite upset. Man, the restaurant next door made my daughter sick. She started projectile vomiting because of the food. I want to sue them. Me, oh no, do you need 911? We can call for you. I look over and the poor kid was crying, understandably, and was clutching her mom's hand. Man, no, I want the police. Not sure why he wanted the police or if he wanted a lawyer, and also not sure why he had to come into the store when he should be taking his kid home or to the hospital. This guy seemed to have terrible priorities. Now the daughter just wanted to be comforted by her dad who was too busy on the phone. She just wanted to be cuddled by people she loved. But no, this guy had to call the police to sue. I saw her try to go up to him, but he kind of shooed her off, and then the mom took her hand again. My heart sank for her. I just wanted to take care of her since her parents were clearly not. So he called the police, and this is what I heard. Man. Yeah, I want to speak to someone about this restaurant. They served my kid rotten food and has made her sick. No, I don't want 911. Well, I want to sue them. Yes, I did mean to call you. What are you going to do about it? Ugh. It was clear the police ended the call on him. Fuming, the man took his family and left. Never found out about what happened, but the restaurant is still there. I think the girl ended up being okay since I didn't hear anything about it in the local news. I sure wouldn't be surprised if she became a regular on the Insane Parents subreddit. Edit. To clarify, the man didn't want 911. He wanted and called the non-emergency police phone number. He could have dialed 911, and I think he should have because then he could have yelled his concerns all day at the police while making sure his kid was okay. But no, he was just dumb and a terrible father. No refunds, no exchange. It's store policy.
Today, my mom, who's 60, and I, 26, female, went off to this hardware store in Canada that not only sells hardware goods, but also automobile goods, garden things, small home appliances, and kitchen stuff, like pots and pans. My mom needed to return a defective pan she bought almost 90 days ago. I told my mom that we might not be able to get a full refund, but let's go to the customer service section to ask what our options were. So off we went. She went straight to the customer service area, and she seemed like she was going to be alright. So I told her I would browse around the store. 10 to 15 minutes had passed, and she hasn't called or texted saying she was done, so I got concerned and went back to the customer service area. When I got there, I could see my mom visibly upset and that a customer service employee was shaking her head and dismissing my mom. We'll call that customer service employee Hannah, early to mid-20s. My mom saw me and started walking towards me and just told me that Hannah was being very rude, condescending, and overall disrespectful to her. I asked her what happened and the conversation went as follows. Mom, hi, I would like to return or exchange this pan since there is a scratch here when I opened it, since I was going to use it this one time. Hannah, no, no refunds or returns on opened items. It is store policy. Mom, well, I wouldn't know if the product would be defective if I didn't open the packaging. Hannah rolls her eyes, widens her eyes to talk to my mom as if she were talking to a little kid that doesn't understand English. No returns or refunds. Mom, well, this is clearly a defective product. I was going to use it, but notice the defect. Hannah, but you have opened it, and it is not unopened and cannot be returned or refunded as per store policy. Mom, but I haven't used it once. Hannah, eyes getting wide again and talking down to my mom as if she were scolding her like a kid. No refunds on open packages. Do you just want to speak to my manager? Mom, yes, please. Manager, hi, we can do an exchange for you since it is still in resaleable condition. Hannah, but it has to be of equal or lesser value or else I am going to charge you for the difference with her eyes all wide and crap <laughs> as per store policy. Mom, okay, I will go look for another pan. At this point, she's finished telling me what had happened and I am livid for someone talking to my mom like this. So we were now browsing for another pan that was of equal or lesser value. I took a look at the receipt and mentioned to my mom that since she bought the pan on sale for $39.99, originally $139, she needed to find one of equal or lesser value. We saw the same pan, but it wasn't on super sale anymore since it was now $59.99. My mom said that it was fine, she'll pay the $20 difference since she really likes the pan. I urged her to look for something of equal or lesser value since this crap store doesn't deserve my mother's money. So while she was looking, I noticed that the original pan she likes has written in bold size, 1000 font, lifetime warranty on the packaging. So I reviewed the back of the receipt to look at the store policy. Store policy is the following. Unopened items with a receipt and original packaging and returned within 90 days of purchase will receive a refund to the original method of payment or will receive an exchange. Items that are opened, damaged, and or not in resaleable condition may not be eligible for a refund or exchange. Exceptions include returns, exchanges, or warranties on an item without a receipt may not be accepted. A defective item is subject to the manufacturer's warranty and will be repaired or replaced. And lo and behold, exceptions include a defective item is subject to the manufacturer's warranty and will be repaired or replaced. I explained to my mom that she doesn't need to pay the $20 difference and she can just get it replaced, as per store policy. She was super hesitant and wasn't sure it was going to work and insisted she will just find a pan worth $39.99. I said, Mama, I love you and I'm a wreck this jerk today. My mom laughed and she sent me to talk to Hannah. Hannah makes eye contact with me and the pan and doesn't say, next in line, me. Just walks up since she was just staring at me. Hi, were you helping my mom earlier about the pan? Hannah rolls her eyes. Uh-huh. Me. From my understanding, she wanted a refund, right? Hannah. Uh, yeah. Me. Okay, cool. So I talked to her, and we just want to get a replacement pan then. No need for a full refund. Hannah. Okay, where's the pan? Me. We don't have it. My mom left it here with you. Hannah looks around. Well, it's not here. I can't do the transaction without the pan, so you have the pan? Me. I can assure you, and if you would like to review the CCTVs, we do not have the pan. Hannah then gets angry and yells for her coworker to look for the pan, in front of multiple customers. After 5 minutes, they found the stupid defected pan. Hannah, okay, but she bought this for 
and it is now $59.99, so I will charge you $20 difference plus tax. Me. Oh, well, since this pan has a lifetime warranty, and that your store policy clearly states that a defective item is subject to the manufacturer's warranty and will be replaced or repaired, I would just like to get it replaced since repairing this pan is nearly impossible. Hannah, shocked Pikachu face. But, but... Me, as per store policy. Finn, with our new pan. Am I the jerk for not giving my pregnant friend my old baby items after I found out she's selling them? I, female 32, just had my third and final kid. He's five months old now. I have loads of baby things from my older kids and also some things I bought brand new. My friend, Tina, who's 37, is currently pregnant with her first. I offered her all my unused baby items along with everything my babies grow out of by the time she's due in December. She likes to shop in secondhand stores, so my baby items certainly weren't beneath her. Baby stuff is so expensive, and when she offered me money for them, I declined, saying I was happy to help her out and see them go to a good home. The items offered included cots, swings, bouncers, clothes, pumps, and a lot more. Last weekend, I dropped my first lot of stuff over as I didn't want to have clutter in my house till December. I brought over all my 0-6 to six month clothes, some still new in packaging, the pump, one swing, and a baby monitor. The next day, I got a Facebook notification that someone I knew posted items for sale on Marketplace. It was Tina, selling everything I dropped over. I was livid and called her to explain myself. She told me she didn't see the big deal. She was going to sell them and use the money towards brand new items. I saw red, went over to her face, and took everything back. I told her she wouldn't be getting everything else I was going to give her either. The way I see it, I gave her those things to be helpful and would have sold them myself if she hadn't taken them. Why should she profit off of me? Later that day, her boyfriend calls me and screams down the phone about how disgusting I am to do that to Tina while she's pregnant and how crappy of a friend I am. But I'm digging my feet in. I really don't think what I did was a jerk move. If anything, she's the jerk for selling my kindness. So, Reddit friends, am I the jerk? Should I be bringing this stuff back to her? ETA I would have donated a lot of the clothes and smaller items to our local charity for the homeless and single parents in need of aid, and only sold the bigger items such as the cot. My rage was her taking away from them and making money out of it. ETA 2 When she offered me money for them, she said, Oh, you're so kind for giving me all of this for baby. It's so hard to baby shop with what's going on. I really should give you something for it. I told her no, and I was just happy to help her out, and she thanked me for making it easier for her. Had she told me that her intent was to sell them, I wouldn't have given her anything and instead offered to buy her something off her baby registry. What do you think? Should she give back all of those items or not? Please let us know. Why is she knocking Tina's hustle though? Am I the jerk if I keep the money a patient left me? I'm 22, female, and I'm a CNA and I do home care. I used to take care of this man who was in his late 90s. He was super sweet, World War II veteran, and a smart guy. He progressively, obviously, got worse as he aged. His daughters were there a lot to watch him slash take care of him, but they got frustrated with him and would yell or storm out. I was pretty much the only person to not yell at him. When he became incontinent, he still would have the urge to go to the bathroom and would try to actually go use the urinal, but his daughters kept telling him to ignore it and just go in his brief instead. It was a mess. I didn't know he had a good amount of money stashed away. The house was small and relatively not well kept. The only real valuable stuff were medals he won from photography contests. I used to take him on drives and help him in a wheelchair and he would tell me all kinds of stories from whatever places we would go to. He recently passed from natural causes. As he got worse, the daughters became more frustrated with him and his inability to be independent. He couldn't walk much, let alone stand. He would shake and fall back, and he started to become more forgetful. I don't think the daughters didn't love him. I mean, they took care of him, but the last couple of years of his life were kind of miserable. They argued constantly. When he passed, I was allowed to attend the funeral to pay my respects. A while later, I found out he left me a sum of money to help with college and that he wanted me to go on to do great things like we had talked about. He said I was going to make a great doctor and there was a pretty emotional letter in it. He left the house to his daughters and some of the money to them, but most of it was left to me, $150,000. The daughters were mad, tried saying I was a horrible person, that I was probably doing him favors I shouldn't have been, and they tried to get me fired ever since by constantly calling my company. My company's HR asked me if I knew anything about this and I said no. This has been a total mess. They said the right thing to do is to give the money to them. There's three daughters, all in their 50s and one in her 60s. I thought about doing it, 
but quite frankly, I don't want to. They didn't treat him that well, and it's not like he didn't leave them anything. They also are all well off themselves and work nice jobs. He wasn't cognitively impaired, no Alzheimer's or dementia or of any kind. The change in his will was made over a year ago before he became more confused and weak. I told my mom, and she said it would be rude to disrespect his wishes, that I took good care of him. We struggled with money for a long time, and she sees this as a gift so I don't have to worry about debt. She's not asking for any of it. So, am I the jerk if I keep the money? Well, what do you think? Should she keep the money or should she give it to the daughters? Please let us know. I think she should give it to me. Karen tries to use our store as her own Etsy shop. I worked in a large department store back before there was Etsy or any similar service for artists to open up independent shops. I worked in the back office administration piece, not out on the floor. One day, one of the checkout girls called me over and said they were trying to scan a lady out, but one of her items didn't have a barcode. I figured maybe it had been stuck on somewhere strange, but checked it out and I didn't see anything. In fact, I didn't even recognize the item when I looked to see where I could find a second one to scan, and I knew the store pretty well. It was an absurdly hideous piece of almost homemade looking costume jewelry, not like anything we offered. I thought maybe we had a new supplier I was unaware of, so looked at the tag, and lo and behold, it was a hand-drawn price tag, so definitely not ours. There were a lot of shops in the area, so I figured someone bought it nearby and it slipped out of their bag or they set it down by accident and that this customer assumed we were selling it because of the price tag. I figured whoever left it would be back to look for it soon. It was way overpriced, $80 for the one necklace, so brought it to customer service and returned to business as usual of counting the minutes to close and regretting my life choices. But as the day marched on, a few more people appeared with similar stuff. Some more jewelry mostly, one with a sweater that was actually a sweater we did sell but with huge garish rhinestones added on that were definitely not a skew we offered. People kept coming to check out with lots of things we actually sold like makeup mirrors, handbags and shoes but all with unnecessary rhinestones, sakins and beads glued on that definitely didn't come from us or the original manufacturer. So finally, the manager just had to do a sweep of the store and collect anything with rhinestones on it or anything with a handmade price tag and put them in the lost and found. Though we did wonder how someone's personal belongings would become scattered all throughout the store and didn't think they could have really been accidentally lost. Our working theory was that someone got in a fight with their shopping companion and did it out of spite, like maybe a couple broke up or a sibling rivalry or something but we resigned ourselves to the fact that we had never know. Our lost and found was a single basket about the size of a TSA security bin at the airport and there was so much of this stuff that it overflowed past the top. So after a couple days, we dumped it all in the trash. A few days after that, a middle-aged woman comes in decked out head to toe in sakins and glitter and rhinestones with neon makeup like a sixth grader would wear to their first school dance and asked to speak to the person in charge identifying herself as one of your partners. I knew we were about to get some answers to the other day's mystery. I stopped all my work. I was ready to hear how and why she ended up leaving half her wardrobe scattered around and why anyone would voluntarily dress like that after 40. So I listened to her going at it with the customer service and it became clear she had bought things here. Maybe unclear if she'd even paid for them or not, or if she had just used things from here without paying for them. She then bedazzled them, either by purchasing them or covertly bedazzling in the store without buying the items. We never did find out which. She then put them back on the shelves and now expected to collect a check after they were purchased at an upsell price that she had added on with her handmade price tag. Apparently, she had done this in a few stores and was going around with business cards claiming her designs, bedazzled versions of department store products, were sold in big department stores like Karen's Fab Designs, as seen on the shelf of Macy's, Nordstrom's, JCPenney, and more. The manager explained this was not a consignment store, and she couldn't just leave altered products here for people to buy and expect to split the money with us. She was sure we must just not understand that she had improved the items with rhinestones, thereby making them more valuable, and was shocked when the realization set in that we understood what she was saying but still didn't want her doing it. She was irate, offended, threatened to break off the partnership that we did not want and did not know we had and eventually demanded the stuff back. 
The most senior manager on the floor had come over by this point, not because she had asked to speak to the person in charge, but because she was causing a scene, and none of us were sure what to do about being on her business card. Plus, everyone, regardless of seniority, was equally curious about the rhinestones mystery, and he explained we had gotten rid of the stuff because she didn't bother to explain this arrangement to any of us, and we aren't a pawn shop where you can hawk personal goods. A major argument ensued. She gave us two choices. Go through the dumpster and salvage the things you threw out, or refund me the adjusted, red upcharged, cost of the items you threw out. The manager then gave her two choices, leave or be escorted out by security. The manager did worry that there could be repercussions for throwing out all her stuff since technically corporate policy was that we were supposed to hang on to lost and found items for seven business days, so he offered her some coupons to end things on a good note. She didn't take them and screamed at us that we needed to replace everything and pay for new material to re-bedazzle them. At that point, the manager more flatly insisted she leave she didn't. Security had to escort her out. To our total shock, she kept telling security she worked here and really confused them because they had never seen her, so weren't sure if it was because she was crazy or if it was because she was from corporate, i.e. someone who could fire them. We had to explain to security and her that in fact she did not work here and this partnership was non-existent. Again, explaining that she couldn't sell her own products here in our department store. She kept saying, we can negotiate you a higher cut. That was just my starting offer. So after a bit, the manager just gave up on explaining and stopped engaging with her. She tried to come in every day for a week after that, to the point that we had a security guard stand right near the door to redirect her before she could even step over the threshold. She got in one more time through the fire door, with which she set off an alarm and we had to evacuate the store. So we let her know loud and clear that next time the police would handle her. I guess some other stores had already made a good on that promise, so she stopped coming. But she kept doing this elsewhere around town for several weeks until she was blacklisted by every store from the highest end boutiques to the dollar store. I don't know if she didn't understand how stores worked or just didn't care, but she really created a lot of extra work for us. I will say this, many people were coming to the register to purchase her items, and that department chain is bankrupt now. So she probably has a lucrative Etsy type store. And the last laugh. So what if you had worked at this store and you caught Karen doing this? What would you say to her? Please let us know. That hustle though. I want to know why they didn't work something out with her. Sounds like she knew what she was doing to be honest. Am I the jerk for telling a friend's boyfriend her intentions of getting pregnant? A couple of years ago, a close friend, Ashley, started a long distance relationship with a guy, Chris. He has been really good to her and after meeting in person a few times, they decided to move in together. I was super happy for her as she had a few bad relationships over the years and it was nice to see her in a healthy one. That joy faded the last couple months before she moved a few states over to be with him. The issue isn't her moving, but that she repeatedly joked about having a baby from Chris. At first, I accepted it as jokes, but over time, I realized Ashley was serious. For context, Ashley has two kids from a previous relationship, ages 10 and 12. Chris absolutely doesn't want kids. He told her this at the start, and any time she hinted possibly wanting more, he shot it down, saying it was a deal breaker. Now, Chris is more than willing to accept her kids as his own, because he loves her, and after meeting her kids, them as well. He's accepted that they are a package deal with her, and since they're at an age where they are semi-independent, it's not an issue for him. To me, Chris is a real bro for taking on her kids without issue. Hearing Ashley say she wants a baby from him, one way or another, really bothered me to no end. It's hard enough to find a partner that treats you well and accepts kids that aren't their own. To find one that does and then talk about plotting to force a baby seems gross and manipulative. Before her move, I had sat down with Ashley trying to talk sense into her. At first, she resisted, but finally it seemed she understood how crappy it would be. After I felt like she had understood, I put the issue behind me and helped support her through the hassle of moving. A few days after she left, I got a call from a mutual friend who delves into the metaphysical realm. She was distraught and confessed to me that shortly before Ashley's move, Ashley had come to her asking for a fertility spell. This friend didn't feel really comfortable about it and refused. When pushed, she said she cast a spell for a healthy and honest relationship but told Ashley it was for fertility. As you can imagine, I was livid. 
I messaged Ashley, confronting her about what I learned, and she laughed it off as she was desperate. But magic is fake anyway, so what's the harm? She then let it slip that since Chris is planning on getting a vasectomy in a few months, she was doing everything she can to get pregnant as soon as possible. At that point, I couldn't stay silent. I gathered up screenshots of all the conversations over the last few months and sent them to Chris. He understandably freaked out and kicked her out. Now Ashley hates me because she was kicked out after a huge move and didn't have a job or money to make it back. She said I'm a terrible person for putting her and her kids out on the street. Am I the jerk here? Should I have kept quiet? What would you have done in this situation? Would you have told Chris the truth about Ashley or not? Please let us know. That girl needs help, like for real bruh. Entitled Mom at Starbucks Years ago in college, I worked at a Starbucks near a high school and middle school. We always had an after school rush with tons of kids getting frappuccinos. If you've never worked at Starbucks, you probably don't know how the drinks are made, so I'll inform you on the magic of the caramel frappuccino. It's basically ice, sugar, milk, sugar, coffee, base, whipped cream, and sugar. The coffee base comes to the store as a powder and they mix it with warm water at the store. We don't brew it there. So I get this girl ordering a caramel frappuccino. No extra requests, just the standard drink. I made it, so I know it was made correctly. I was a trainer and shift supervisor and had a fancy black apron. She brings the caramel frappuccino back, complaining that the coffee tastes burnt. I actually laughed. It's basically just coffee flavoring, and if you've ever had one, they don't taste like coffee at all. So I kindly explained that, well, the coffee in this drink isn't brewed, and it all comes from the same place. So yeah, of course I'll remake it, but it will definitely have the same flavor. I offered to do extra caramel flavor and topping to make it even sweeter. She agreed. I remade the thing, asked her to try to make sure it was better this time. I even tried a sample of that pitcher and a tiny cup to make sure nothing was off about it, like maybe there wasn't enough water in the mix. It was fine. So I called the girl up to the counter again, gave her the second frap, told her to keep the first one. OMG. So like an hour later, mom comes in with the kid. She was demanding I give them their money back. She was all mad because I was rude to laugh. I tried to explain that sorry, it's just really funny, and I wanted to explain how the drink was made so the kid could order it the way she likes it next time. I also explained that we don't give cash back. I gave her a brand new drink she was happy with and offered a free drink card for next time. No go. I'm calling corporate to report your rude behavior, blah, blah, blah. I gave her the phone number and said, be my guest, all with a smile. Edit, the hot chocolate story. Here you go, folks. The case of the too hot chocolate. My other post made people happy, so here's another one from Starbucks. It was near closing time when a regular came through with their usual order, two kids hot chocolates. The espresso machines had a button for kids temp which automatically shuts off the streamer at a slightly lower temperature. Regular temp is like 160, 140 for kids. I think this was years ago. There's a couple of facts to the case that need to be mentioned. One, these folks normally came through during rush, so their drinks would usually be sitting on the cashier counter for a few minutes before being handed through the window. Two, our second and third espresso machines were already taken down for cleaning that night. So when they pull up, they get their hot chocolate immediately off the bar, no wait time. I could tell that the couple were in a bad mood, but I didn't really think about it. Well, the crew and I hear literal tires screeching and see the vehicle pull through the drive through straight to the window. The husband knocked on the window, but I was already on my way from the back to go see what was up. Mom yells, These hot chocolates are way too hot. If I gave this to my kids, they'd burn their mouths. So I offered a few fixes, milk and ice cubes or two extra whipped cream. No go. Mom wants them remade at kids' temperature this time. I left the original drinks in view of the window. As a seasoned food service worker, I know what happens if those leave few. So we remade them, added a splash of cold milk, and handed them over. Mom screamed, These are the same ones! I pointed out the ones on the counter, which had stickers. Since this didn't go through the register, no stickers. They take the drinks, and Mom comments, How hard is it to mess up a hot chocolate? Then we see them pull into a parking spot. I sent the two baristas to the back and had my shift supervisor in training up front because I knew this was going to be bad. The people hanging out in the cafe area heard the entire thing and were all watching the door as well. Mom comes in yelling about how she's so glad she tested the drinks the first time because they were way too hot. I gave her two free drink cards, 
She said we owed her more than some free drinks. She wanted an apology. I didn't see it, but she accused my coworker of rolling his eyes. She then goes on to scream, I own my own business, and I'd never treat people with this level of disrespect. The hot cocos fly at us. We dodge. At this point, I pointed to the door and just said, Out, now, or we call the police. Do not come back to this store. We have your license plate on camera. This whole thing is on camera. She left immediately. They came back one other time during the day. I marked out their drinks, so they got them free, and I reiterated, Do not ever come back here. They never did after that. The third case fact I'll put here, because we had no way of knowing beforehand. 3. That machine was overheating and not shutting off at 140. I checked after close and it was going to 160. But we had no way of knowing at the time of the incident and if I had known, I would have asked the barista to just do it manually. But so much was made of the kid's temp thing, I ensured that she pressed the button. The end. Speaking of Starbucks, what's your favorite drink from Starbucks? Please let us know. Mmm, coconut frappuccino for the win. Am I the jerk for making a fake diary entry to catch my stepmom? I, 17 female, have been staying with my dad and my stepmom. My mom is a doctor, so she was super paranoid about my family living with her during what's going on. But as things where I live are settling down, she let us come stay with her again. My stepmom has known me for two years, and our relationship has always been weird. She's a nice person, but she can be pretty mean and childish if we do something she doesn't like. She also has a tendency to run to our dad if she hears something bad about us. Long story short, I have a diary and I keep a lot of private stuff in it. Dad called me a few days ago, we were visiting with our mom, saying he has to talk to me when I come back. Apparently, I was in trouble because of something I apparently said to stepmom. When he told me what she said I had said, I immediately recognized it because I wrote it in my diary. I realized a lot of the stuff I wrote down was stuff she was telling him so I decided to come up with a plan to see if I was right. I wrote a fake entry basically saying stuff I would never do in a million years and set the trap. Dad calls me while out visiting with friends and when I come back, he grounds me for what I did. Stepmom comes in later, apologized and said it sounded concerning and she had to tell. I told her it was fake, knew she read my diary and refused to speak to her. My dad came in and tried to talk to me and I told him that stepmom was reading my diary and he didn't believe me. Now I'm with my mom and I don't know if what I did was fair. I felt it was the only way to prove my point and I didn't know what else to do. Am I the jerk? Who do you think is in the right? OP or their stepmom? Please let us know. Oh, I just love invading other people's privacy. Maliciously complying with a no phone rule in science class. My junior year of high school, 2016 to 2017, I had to take a biology class. It was generally a freshman or sophomore class, but as I had been jumping between high schools, I still needed the biology credit. As such, I was the only junior in the class. My science teacher was a very rude person, not in a I hate you kind of way, but more in a I'm better than all of you and I can do no wrong kind of way. He made it a habit to hand out detentions like candy to the point where the school had to ask him to stop giving people detention. Obviously, none of us liked him and made it our sole purpose to annoy the crap out of him. And thus, the entire year was full of malicious compliance from all of us, like not coming back to class when he sent us out of the room. As the teacher added more rules, it became easier to find ways to annoy him. When he added a rule about leaving backpacks in the front of the room with phones in them, I was already having a bad day and decided to have some fun. We were watching some video about turtles and I was using my phone. When he caught me, he told me to put it in my backpack, so I did. About 10 minutes later, I decided to make it look like I was on my phone by putting my hands under my desk and looking in my lap. Anytime he yelled at me, other students would yell back saying, he's not even on his phone, why are you yelling at him? I did this several times throughout the class and he moved me three separate times to try and watch me better and catch me on my phone, which wasn't with me. I finally ended up at the front of the room in front of the projector playing the turtle movie, facing the rest of the class in a chair with no desk so he could see my hands. This made it so no one could watch the movie, which means we couldn't take the test on it. Three weeks later, the teacher proudly told our whole class he wouldn't have to deal with kids like you anymore because he was switching to a middle school the next year. I guess he was wrong because the next year he got fired from the middle school as none of his students were on track with any other school in the district. Edit. The turtle movie wasn't part of the material we were supposed to be learning. Our teacher just liked turtles and wanted to watch a movie about them, so the class already wasn't focused on what it should have been. 
Most of the material we learned in that class wasn't what we were supposed to be learning. Same reason he was fired from the middle school the next year. Speaking of turtles, do you like turtles? Please let us know. I like turtles. Fine then, I won't stay inside your house. So this happened yesterday to my grandma's youngest brother and his wife. They had an argument about a lot of issues which I won't get into, and ultimately the argument escalated to a full-blown verbal fight. It's because of husband's dismissive attitude and anger issues. The husband is a jerk, and he said that if the wife can't respect his wishes, then she can't stay inside his house. The wife is upset and packs a suitcase and leaves the house at around 9.30 p.m. at night. He assumes that she will come back by 10 and doesn't even try to stop her. He waits till 11 p.m. and she isn't back and also she is not answering any calls or replying to texts. His 20-year-old daughter starts crying and made a huge scene in the house. He sets off to go and search for her. It's important to note that this is a small rural town where everyone knows each other. The husband has an old car with no silencer and a few people in the nearby houses wake up. He explains what happened to them and then everyone starts searching for her. It's 1 a.m. in the morning and still she has not been found. The police station in town is at least four hours away, so they have to go in the morning. Also, it was on lockdown. The husband is extremely worried and everyone was angry with him for being so unkind to his wife and not stopping her. Someone then suggested one last search in the estate that they have just in case they find at least some clues. This time, they even checked the terrace of the tiny building where the solar panel was placed, which had been deemed unnecessary before. The terrace was surprisingly unlocked, and when they went in, they found her. She had made a small pillow of her clothes and was sleeping with her head on the suitcase. She was woken up, and it was found out that she had switched off her phone. The wife knew that it wasn't safe to go out at night, but she didn't want to go back to her house, so this was the place she chose to stay in. The best part is that the daughter already knew. She denied it, but confided in grandma and she did the extra theatrics to scare her dad. Everyone still took the wife's side, and some people even threatened the husband. In conclusion, the husband is really scared of the wife and will definitely keep his anger in check in the future. Am I the jerk for not paying for my date's meal? Okay, so this story took place a few years ago, but it's something that still crosses my mind occasionally. When I, 20 female, went on a date with my friend, 22 male, it didn't go exactly as planned, we had been speaking for about a week or so prior about going out to dinner somewhere. It was his idea and he was fairly persistent. He was insanely interested in me and while I wasn't as interested in him, I figured I'd give it a shot. He had originally wanted to take me to a steakhouse, which I was later glad we didn't. We ultimately settled on a local Mexican restaurant. Dinner was going well and the conversation was flowing smoothly. We ordered our meals, nothing too expensive, and some cheese dip. The bill would have been probably around $30 or so. After we're finished eating, my friend comes out of complete left field with, So, I don't actually have any money. Can you pay for the meal? To say I was shocked was an understatement. This guy had been begging me to come out to dinner with him for an entire week, almost picking out an incredibly expensive restaurant, the steakhouse, knowing he had absolutely no way to pay for anything, not even his own meal. I'll admit that I had enough money to cover both of the meals. However, I told him I only had enough to cover my own. Had he have been upfront with me about paying for the meal before we ever went out, I would have been more than happy to. However, I was blindsided. I took the bill and explained to the restaurant manager that I was only paying for my portion and the cheese dip. He then began arguing with my friend about how he needed to pay for his meal. The manager obviously wasn't just going to allow my friend to leave, so I told him I needed to go. He couldn't believe I wouldn't help him out, and I ultimately unfriended him for putting me in such an awkward and embarrassing situation. Should I have just paid for his and called it a day? I've never been the type of person to just expect people to hand over money or pay for my things, so I don't expect it from others either. What would you have done in this situation? Would you have paid for his meal or not? Please let us know. I'd help that boy find a job is what I would do. Karen wants her stolen table set back. When I was 9 in 2011, my folks and I moved into a rental house. The previous tenant left behind two things, a beautifully carved stone table and chair set and a very shy ginger cat. We adopted the cat. The table and chairs sat in the front yard, easily seen by anyone walking past. Coming home from school, I find my mom talking with police and a massive dead patch of grass where the table used to stand. Somehow, someone had stolen the table set. It wasn't light. A truck would have been needed to cart it away. We never got it back. A year later, Karen knocks on the door. The conversation may be paraphrased slightly as it happened so long ago. Mom. Hi, can I help you? Karen. Yeah, hi. I used to live here and wanted to organize a time to retrieve my stone table set. 
Mom, the table set that was sitting in the front yard? That's the one. I was thinking, Mom, hold on, hold on. That set was stolen about a year ago. And even if it wasn't, you left it here without any contact for over two years. Landlord tried to contact you, but you essentially abandoned the property. Karen, well, I didn't have room for it at my new place. Now I do. I have the receipt, so it's still mine. Mom, it was stolen, and I noticed you haven't asked about the cat you left here either. Karen, you think you can push that thing on me when you don't have my table set? Mom, God, no. I wouldn't let you anywhere near him with your attitude. He's registered to us now anyway. You have no more business here. Leave. She slammed the door in Karen's face. I had never seen my mom so angry. She hugged our cat for 10 minutes straight. Karen wasn't finished though. She called the cops, because of course she did. Cops arrived, Mom went out to meet them. She didn't want me to hear what went on, but she summarized later. Basically, Karen claimed Mom was hiding her table set and preventing her from getting her property back. Mom explained what happened, provided the landlord's phone number, and suggested they look in their records because the table was officially stolen. Police left, Karen didn't get her table, we kept the cat. Karen loses it on poor cashier because she couldn't give her money to feed her kid. Today I ran into possibly the most entitled Karen and Goblin I've seen in a while. So a little backstory. My best friend is British, while I'm Latin American. As an early birthday gift, she sent me some cash through Western Union for me to get my nails done at this incredibly fancy salon I'd been wanting to go to for a while and I had to pick it up at this agency where you can collect cash or pay bills. When I got there, there was a huge queue, but since I was on a tight schedule, I had no option but to bite the proverbial bullet and queue. Anyway, I walked over to the queue, whipped out my Nintendo Switch, and proceeded to search for moons all over Mario Odyssey's world. After maybe five minutes, a young woman that was already in the queue told us that Western Union system was down and that we had to wait. I weighed my options and decided to stay around for a little while. Otherwise, I'd have to pick up the money some other time. Just as I moved out of the queue, Karen and her goblin made their appearance. The woman had to be in her late 40s, early 50s, and her kid was around four. She already had this, I need the manager look about her. And when she heard what the young woman had said, she saw the opportunity to rant and you can bet your butt she took it. She complained about how slow the cashier was, about the fact that she had been there for 40 minutes already, about how the cashier was probably so slow because she didn't know how to do her job. I tuned her out and went back to my game. When Karen noticed no one was paying attention, she went back to the queue, intent on getting her money, even if the system was not up and running. As I said before, the queue was huge, so it was a good 20 minutes before Karen got to the cashier. While we waited, her goblin ran around the place, screamed, and kicked the walls over and over. So much so, that he left countless imprints of his shoe on the walls. Meanwhile, Karen said nothing, and let her kid do as he pleased. An old lady tried to gently calm him down, but he simply wouldn't listen. Anyway, when Karen finally made it to the register, the conversation went like this. Karen, I am here to get my money. Cashier, I'm sorry ma'am, the system is still not working. I suggest you try again around 3 p.m. It was 12 p.m. The system should be up and running by then. Karen lost her mind right then and there. She started screeching. No, that is not happening. I'm not moving from this spot until I get my money. Cashier, ma'am, as I told you, there's nothing I can do if the system isn't working. That's a lie. You are a liar. You don't know how to do your job. That's what's going on here. You are a new employee and you are useless and don't know how to do your job. Cashier, visibly upset. Ma'am, I've worked here for over a year and a half. I know how to do my job. If the system is down, there is BS. Why don't you restart your computer? Why don't you try to fix it? I want my money now. You probably want me to come back at 3 p.m. because that's when the other cashier clocks in and she, unlike you, knows how to do her job. By this stage, everyone in the queue was either baffled, angry, or a mixture of both. 
The guy behind her was livid. He walked up to Karen and told her to shut up and leave the cashier alone because she was no one to give her orders, especially when it was clear she had no idea what she was talking about. Karen didn't back down. I'm not shutting up. This woman has my money. I need the money because I have none left. Not even to pay for the bus back home or buy my son lunch. He is hungry and has been here for two hours already. Not true. Nobody seemed to care much about this. And they tell Karen to get out because she was holding everybody up. Seeing as the system was down and the situation was a sideshow, I put away my Nintendo, turned on my heels, and I started to walk out of there, towards the Starbucks cafe inside the agency. Just as I was walking out, I bumped into the same young woman who had let us know the system was down. Young woman, the system's still down, right? I nodded. Young woman, oh, well, I guess I'll have to go to another Western Union to get my money. Now, I've been using Western Union for years, and I know its ins and outs. If the system is down, then every single Western Union agency won't be working. I told her that it was pointless for her to try and go somewhere else and suggested that she wait like the cashier said since it wasn't unusual for the system to fail every once in a while. Unluckily for us, Karen overheard. She had been kicked out of the queue, but still wasn't done. She made a beeline for us, ready to talk crap about the cashier. Karen, that useless jerk has no idea what she is talking about. How does she know that the system would be up and running by 3 p.m.? Is she a witch or something? I don't think so. She just doesn't want to do her job. How hard can it be to restart her computer? I felt my soul give a silent cry at this boomer not understanding how the internet works, but I still kept my cool and put on a smile. I explained to her that the problem was not the computer, but rather the system the computer was connected to. So restarting the computer wouldn't have solved anything. I also told her I've been using Western Union for years and that it isn't uncommon for it to fail sometimes, but that it will be up and running in a few hours. Still, Karen wasn't buying it. She was determined to think the cashier was a useless lump and she said so loudly. That was when I lost it. Me. Listen, the cashier did nothing wrong. There is a problem in the system. It's not working anywhere right now. What part of this do you not understand? But the woman didn't even- No, stop it. She did nothing wrong. You were in the wrong. You can't talk to people like that. You were rude. I kid you not. Karen gave me a death glare. And what do you know? You weren't here before. She made me wait for hours, and my kid is hungry, and I have no money to feed him. But what do you know about dealing with an upset child? She was right. I don't deal with an upset kid. I deal with 30 at a time, because I am a teacher. Anyway, after she said that, I told her it wasn't the woman's fault her kid was hungry or that she had no money for the bus. She still had no right to talk to the woman like that. Karen waved me off, rolled her eyes, and said something about me not knowing crap. I smiled to myself, loudly clasped my hands, and said, Well, looks like being a jerk runs in the family. Karen stopped dead in her tracks and spun on her heels to face me, ready to attack. She started screaming at me that I have no idea what it was like to have a hungry child. I never got to hear the rest of her sentence because I was done with her. I had turned on my heels, marched into the nearby Starbucks, and slammed the door behind me, leaving a livid Karen talking to herself. So Karen, what did you think of today's stories? They were horrible. Horrible? How dare you? These were some of the best we've ever read. Oh, shut up, Mr. Reddit. It's ridiculous what people like myself have to go through. Dealing with stupid people like yourself and your subscribers. Look, Karen, you can say whatever you want about me, but don't you talk about my re-army. Tch, re-army. Most of your viewers aren't even subscribed to your channel. 70% if I'm correct. Well, I can't argue with that. That's true, most... Most of my viewers don't actually subscribe for some reason. It's because you're stupid, Mr. Reddit. No, I'm not. All right, guys, let's prove Karen wrong by making sure you're subscribed to the channel and turn on notifications. Pah, they're not going to listen to you. And if you'd like me or Karen 
What? To record a special message for you, come visit me on Fiverr, link pinned in the comments below. Never! And join as a channel member today, and Karen will give you a special shout out in the next video. Like heck I will!